going around the table. Nancy, would you get us started? Um, Nancy King from um, Wake Forest School of Medicine. Holly Fernandez Lynch from the Perelman School of Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania. Leslie Wolf from Georgia State University College of Law. Jeff Rodmar, Department of Ed. Karen Jeans, VA. Ann Andrews, National Institute of Standards and Technology. Joanne Less, Office of Good Clinical Practice. <laughs> it's been a long morning already <laughs> at FDA. Marisa Gordon Wynn, HHS, Office for Civil Rights. Sandy Berry, Rand Corporation. Aviva Katz, University of Pittsburgh. Stephen Rosenfeld, Quorum Review IRB. Jerry Menikoff, OHRP. Cecilia Chirinos, OHRP. Thank you. And are there any ex officios in the audience who would identify themselves? Thank you. All right. Um, before we get started with the, so one one comment: we have four people who are absent, expected to be absent. For so for SACARP members, it is really important that you're here for all the deliberations because we're on the edge of quorum. So just a reminder for the next couple of days. Um, and then housekeeping. Uh, I hope you've all had a chance to look at the minutes from our last meeting, and I would entertain a motion to approve. Second? Second. Moved and seconded to approve the minutes from our last meeting. Discussion? All in favor say aye. Motion passed. Thank you. All right. So now we proceed with the agenda. Jerry, anything to start us off with? First of all, I'd like to welcome everybody. I um, want to thank, uh, in particular, the members of the SACARP subcommittees, uh, SACARP members, um, ex officios, uh, all the many people have been working on various issues um, since the last meeting. Um, thank you all for the work that led up to today's meeting. Uh, I'm sure it's going to be a very interesting one. And uh, we, we, on behalf of OHRP, very much appreciate all of your work. Um, just to bring mention one notable update that I know a lot of you are aware of. Um, relatively recently, there was a notice of proposed rulemaking that was sent from HHS to the Office of Management and Budget. Um, it is titled, Proposed One-Year Delay of the General Implementation Date While Allowing Use of Three Burden-Reducing Provisions During the Delay Year. And I'll just read you a statement that has been issued uh, by the uh, Public Affairs Office within HHS. Um, the, and I'll just note, this is a proposed rule. I've because it's a notice of proposed rulemaking, so it's just proposed at the moment. The rule is now under review at the Office of Management and Budgets, Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs. All notices of proposed rulemaking are required to go through the formal rulemaking process. It is HHS policy not to discuss the details of such proposals before they appear in the Federal Register for public comment. So that that was the statement issued by HHS. So. In, on behalf of OHRP, we are not permitted to actually discuss the content of that rule, of, of that proposal. Um, you do have the title. Your people are certainly able to kind of try to figure out what it's talking about from that, but, but just so it, it, it's not our being obstructionist in any way, but, but we're just following HHS policy. Um, so uh, that's the only thing I wanted to mention. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Jerry. So I'll second the welcome. And I actually um, still am relatively new to this role and participate when I can in the subcommittee meetings by phone. And I have to also thank the subcommittee. I mean, we're dealing with things that are on their surface fairly straightforward, many of the changes. Um, but then when you scratch the surface, there are enormous complexities. And the subcommittees um, have really been trying to deal with that and I think doing a wonderful job, and you'll see the fruits of that today. So um, I would second Jerry's um, thank you to them. And then I guess we're a little bit ahead of schedule, but that's good. And we can get started with the uh, first agenda item, which is uh, Dr. Lau introducing OHRP's public outreach website.
So good, mon good morning, everybody. You can hear me well. So I'm really excited to have this opportunity today to actually um, tell you all about this project that OHRP has been working on, and we launched it at the beginning of this year. So as you all know very well, this is um, just trying to get this to work. All right, so all of you know very well our mission, right? Um, however, in order to support this mission, part of the responsibility of the Division of Education and Development is also to conduct public outreach and education uh, or information programs to promote and enhance the public awareness of the activities of HRP and human subjects protection. So this has always been one of our mandates. And the reason that this is an important thing is that um, as many of you um, have expressed this over the years and we've heard from the uh, general community, from the public, that there is really the need to have information, reliable source of information for the public to learn about research and to understand about research participation. And the reason that we think that this is an important part is that it's really um, uh, important for it as a way to promote ethical research um, with appropriate protections and also to improve the protections for research volunteers and hopefully by doing that and to leveling the playing ground that we could actually develop trust um, partnerships, mutual trust and partnerships. So this is an important um, uh, agenda to pro promote public trust and from OHRP's point of view we are uniquely positioned to do this because if you look at you know the reasons for all this, you know, these are the reasons for our existence, if you like. These are the reasons why we are here, um, to promote this uh, protections for the public, to promote ethical uh, and sound research designs. So by, uh, I think that, you know, in the case of OHRP, we uh, can give the public uh, a source of information that is relatively free from com other competing interests and conflicts, if you like. So in January this year, um, we launched this website called About Research Participation. We also, as you all know, you know, sometimes if you go to OHRP's website, it's really hard to find information. So we also, you know, fought to get this, um, what they call vanity URL. Basically, it's just hhs.gov forward slash about research participation. So it's easy for people to remember and it's easy for people there to, therefore to get to. Indeed, I think that if you type into Google HHS about research participation, it will give you this, um, the link to this website. So we launched it at the beginning of um, this year and the goal for us was to post materials that are relevant and meaningful to potential research participants. Uh, we want this information to I want, we want the research participants or potential research participants to find you know, this information um, useful, meaningful in the sense that it could help them if they were thinking about participating in research, it could help them to make good informed decisions. Um, in delivering or in producing the content or the materials, we also pay a lot of attention to the accuracy. Um, that is a challenge to, to provide information that is accurate and that it's impartial. Um, we also want to say that, you know, we don't want to embellish unnecessarily and we want this information to be sincere and down to earth. Now, we also need to present this information in plain language that is understandable and that is also at the same time engaging. And I think for all those of you who have tried to produce information suitable for public consumption, that there is a challenge to, to have the accuracy, to be not patronizing, to actually be able to give that information accurately. So that is always a challenge for our team. And we also aim to provide the materials in both English and Spanish uh, as much as possible. And then the last challenge is very much a federal government one um, to provide these materials with, um, you know, that comply with the Section 508 requirement, which is that people with disabilities would be able to access them. And then sometimes that limits the format in, uh, in which we can actually use to, to develop this content. So in terms of content development, I guess this is the point where I can actually brag a little bit about my team. So uh, within the Division of Education and Development, we really have a great team together. We have people with background in medicine, law, bioethics, 
education, science, public education. And that is a great, great asset. So we develop the ideas uh, in response to our perceived needs. Of course, as you know, our team goes around the country to deliver um, workshops and to speak with stakeholders. This, we really represent the outward side of OHRP. So we get to hear a lot from, from stakeholders. Um, we have ideas, we formulate the, uh, these ideas, we talk to our o, um, OHR, um, OSH, HHS OSH um, colleagues in media and communications, we talk with our own colleagues in the office, and we would, then do, and we would also look into what's available already um, outside and see how we can actually uh, make a difference there or not. So we don't really want to, so you will find that, you know, often if it's very scientifically centered materials or if it's like definitions that we really cannot improve further on, we would probably just utilize and recycle other people's ideas um, by putting a link in our site so that people can go to. And, and a good example of that is, you know, the glossary of terms, for example, um, you know, terms that we use often in clinical research. We, our team started thinking about, okay, well, maybe we should work on this. And then lo and behold, we find that, hey, actually, clinicaltrials.gov have a really perfectly good glossary. And we find, you know, if we're going to do this, we'll probably be repeating a lot of the definitions. So, you know, there's no need to do that. And it's a very reliable source of information. So we include a link in our site to get there. So anyway, um, we would develop the content and we would get stakeholders' input. Um, stakeholders can be from uh, the research community, be investigators. It could also be you know, um, IRB folks, um, clinical trial coordinators, patients themselves, people who, are, have been, who have participated in research in the past. So we get their inputs. Um, there is a limit to how much we can do there, as many of you know. Um, and then we gather all the comments, and then we get this, um, you know, we, our team would write and develop this um, content. Um, here, again, is another chance for me to just say thank you to some of the contractors that we work with. Um, we have Ripple Effect Communications that help us with developing the, image, the images and, and giving us advice as to how to deliver the contents in an engaging manner. And at the end of the day, when we're done with develop, uh, developing the content and it's ready, you know, we also have um, another set of contractors, DS Federal, that work with us closely to get this material up on our website to make sure that it's 508 compliant and uh, to, to satisfies all the requirements uh, that H HHS requires. So this is an ongoing project. So note that this is not a one-off campaign. So this website is actually housed on our OHRP website. It's easy enough to get to because it has this vanity URL about research participation. Currently, there are, actually in this moment in time, there are three sections, um, information videos, questions to ask, and additional resources. Um, the third item on the screen here, protecting research participation, is a set of infographics that we actually are in the process of getting 508 compliance, compliance clearance and that we'll be posting on our website soon. In your folders and outside on the table, we have provided a set of these infographics so that you can see what they are, but I'll talk about that a little bit later. So as we move forward with this project, we probably add sections to um, the content. We may also add various things like, for example, videos. This is the page that show the informational videos. When we first launched it, we um, launched it with three sets of videos, part one, two, three, what is research, clinical trials, and questions to ask. And just very, very recently, literally about a week ago, we also released the, the, a new video on randomization, which I'll show you in a minute. So all these videos are kind of short, three to, we try to keep it to about three to four minutes, but sometimes it's hard. So you can see with randomization, we have let it to flow until uh, up to about seven minutes. I also want to draw your attention to this questions to ask page. Um, this is what you see on the actual website. It's presented like an infographics. And if you hover over the little arrows, then a little box will come out and give you the set of questions for that particular section. So it's actually very easy to, to read on the, um, on the, the mobile devices. On the other, um, at the same time, you see print button um, at the top and at the bottom. And when it's printed out, that's what you get. A um, principal, you know, um, letters, uh, two-pager that you can print on both sides, and it's actually 
large fonts and everything, and it's displayed in a manner that is easy to refer to and easy to read. To. I have to apologize. The ones that you have in your folders is a little bit printed off-sided, and that's partly because of our old printer. <laughs> Unfortunate. But anyway, it should look like this, nice and pretty. <laughs> so we pay a lot, as you, as you see, because this, these are things that we deliver to the public. We actually pay a lot of attention to how things look and how things would... Um, that they would see them. And um, the content is very important. So in, on this um, questions to ask list, we included a list of very comprehensive questions that we think a potential participant is likely to want to ask in order to make an informed decision if they were approached to participate in research. Notice that these are in question formats. We did it like that because we think that by presenting them as question format, it's not only they can take this, download this, print this, look at it, think about it. So they're asking the questions to themselves already, right? But also that they can take this as a kind of checklist if there were particular questions that particularly interest them and that they want to ask their research, they can take this with them and they can, you know, look at it and ask, you know how it is that when you go up to an investigator or you talk to a doctor, so to speak, sometimes you have all these questions at home and by the time you get there, all of a sudden it's all forgotten, you know, and I kind of mixed it all up and, you know, get confused. Having something like that is, you know, it's helpful. It reassures you. It reminds you. So that's really the purpose that we did it for. Um, the questions are grouped together in manners that we think would make sense to the um, potential participant. Um, hopefully that would strengthen how, you know, strengthen the context under which the information is, is sought. And again, like I said, it's printable on a, on a sheet of paper. And we think that is not really just... We, you know, potential participants can take this along with them and use them, but that at clinics or at the research centers, um, research staff can possibly use this as a tool to remind them or to check with their, you know, with the potential participants as to whether the information has been delivered and that they have understood it in, in the way that is uh, presented here. So this is the set of infographics that we are about to launch, and we launch it under a tab uh, on the side called Protecting Research Volunteers. So this idea came about, we were thinking, like, okay, well, you know, a lot of people don't really know um, much about what sort of protections, what are, pro what are these protections, what, what sort of protections are there, and under what situations do I, would I get some of these protections. So, of course, we, we developed this from the perspective of OHRP, we have to say. Um, and they, there are five tabs to this. There's a landing page, and there's a five tab to this. Um, why regulations? So how do the reg regulations come about? Um, princ the principal regulations, and we're talking about 45 CFR 46 of the common rule. Um, who oversees and enforces this set of regulations? And then under the tab other regulation, as you know, a lot of, regu a lot of research is not necessarily under the common rule or the federal or, or HHS um, uh, oversight. So, you know, we tell them also, like, okay, what, are, what may be other protections that are around? We mentioned FDA, of course. Um, and then we talk about shared responsibility. We want to really bring out this idea that, you know, it is really, everybody is in, involved in this, and it's not, you know, just one group of people doing everything, um, but it is shared amongst the regulators, the sponsors, the institutions, IRBs, the, even the, the potential, or the participants, research participants themselves. So you also have a set of this infographics in the folder. Again, there was some printing issue, but the ones outside on the table, they're printed more nicely. And then there is the additional, additional resources section. Um, like I said, we try to, you know, utilize some of the uh, available information. Normally, um, we do not accept any kind of uh, people soliciting putting their website on here because it's hard for us to um, review all this material and to make a decision as to, okay, well, if we put this, this group's material on it, does it mean that you know, other groups have not put on it, that their material is not as good? So we don't really want to enter into that uh, arena. Uh, we tend to limit ourselves to um, federal websites if possible. Um, and, and like I said, you know, our team do... Our team does go out and look at different resources, and we, if we really see that you know a certain set of resources is you know has overwhelming really you know positive or meaningful um, impact, possibly we'll consider and we'll talk to our OHRP colleagues and see whether it's suitable to include it. So 
I think it's time for us to um, review a clips. Okay, let me just show you. So this is how it looks like for the questions to ask page. And if you hover and click over it, you can see the list of questions. And of course, you can then easily click the print button and go to what we, you know, a page like this, and then you can easily print and download that. Hello, the Federal Office for Human Research Protections, or OHRP, created these videos to help you learn more about participating in research. Deciding if you want to volunteer for a research study can be difficult, and this decision can have important consequences. Research that compares interventions or treatments commonly uses randomization as part of the study design, which means that volunteers are assigned randomly to particular study arms or groups. Which intervention or treatment the volunteers receive depends on the study arm they are assigned to. This video provides some basic information about why researchers use randomization in studies and what randomization means to you as a potential research volunteer. When something happens randomly, that means it happens completely by chance and that no one can predict or control the result. Drawing numbers out of a hat to separate people into two teams is a random procedure. So is flipping a coin to decide who goes first in a game. Randomization is a commonly used procedure in clinical research Research volunteers may be randomized to different arms in a study. This means that a volunteer's assignment to a particular study arm is by chance, and that it is not planned or controlled by the researcher, the volunteer's doctor, or anyone else. Which study arm a volunteer ends up in is random, like whether a coin flip comes up heads or tails without any input from the study team. Researchers use randomized assignment to help get reliable answers to research questions. Suppose researchers want to know if a new drug can help people fight an infection better than one already being used. They enroll volunteers who have the type of infection the drugs are supposed to treat. Then they randomly assign volunteers to one of two study arms. In one study arm, volunteers receive a drug that is currently prescribed by doctors. Volunteers in the other study arm receive the new experimental drug. Then, researchers collect information about how the volunteers in each group respond to the different drugs. If the researchers get to decide who gets which drug and don't use randomization, they might unintentionally give people who seem sicker the new drug, perhaps because they think the new drug might work better. Or maybe they would give sicker volunteers the commonly used medicine because they have more experience with it. But if either of those things happened, the results of the study wouldn't tell researchers whether one drug really works better than the other because the volunteers in each arm are too different from each other. A difference in results between the two study arms might occur just because one arm includes sicker volunteers. To make sure that any differences in results between the study arms are caused only by the different drugs, the volunteer groups need to be similar in health and other characteristics. Like the saying goes, it's important to compare apples with apples. Randomization is supposed to help make the groups more similar. When volunteers are assigned randomly to the study arms, no one controls which group a volunteer will be in. Therefore, as long as there are enough volunteers, the study arms should be similar. In our example, each study arm would have roughly the same number of volunteers with mild and serious infections and be generally similar in other characteristics. This way, the only thing that is different between the two groups is the drug they take. The researchers can be more certain that any differences in the results are caused by the drugs being studied and not the characteristics of the volunteers in the groups. This is why randomized studies can produce more reliable results. Sometimes, researchers take additional steps to avoid unintentionally influencing the results. 
For example, they may design the study so that volunteers won't know or are blinded to which group they are in. Other times, both the researchers and the volunteers don't know which group the volunteers are in. This is called a double-blind study. It ensures that no one can intentionally or unintentionally influence the results. Double-blind randomized studies are one of the best research designs and generally produce the most reliable results. If you are asked to participate in a research study with a randomized design, here's what you need to know. Your assignment to a particular study arm or group is done randomly, like a coin flip. The research team cannot choose which group you end up in. Similarly, your doctor cannot choose which study arm you end up in even if she or he thinks that one group might be better for you than the other. Your assignment to a study arm is entirely by chance. You also cannot choose which group you are in, and you may not get the one that you want. It is possible that the researcher, your doctor, and you will not know which study arm you are in and won't be allowed to find out as long as the study is still going on. It is important to remember that, unlike medical treatment, research is not designed to specifically address your needs and interests as an individual patient. The care that you receive in a research study does not necessarily put your individual interests first will not necessarily benefit you and could even be harmful, even though there are protections in place. Research volunteers can help science answer specific medical or behavioral questions. Researchers hope that these answers will contribute to a better understanding of human biology and behavior and lead to more effective medical treatments in the future. This video was designed to answer some basic questions about randomization in research and give you some things to think about. Deciding whether to participate in research can be hard. Don't be afraid to ask the research team for more information and talk with them about your concerns. It's their job to give you the information you need so you can make the most informed decision about whether to participate. OHRP has created a variety of resources to help you think about research participation. For more information, check out our website at www.hhs.gov forward slash about dash research dash participation. That is our latest um, video on randomization. So like I said, you probably noticed that unlike some videos outside that talk about the same subject, we try to really be more down to earth about what it is that is involved. We try, I'm trying to find the right word. We try not to embellish the situation and we want to leave it out for potential participants to really think about these things and to think about it for themselves. So I think this is really what we are trying to achieve. In developing the video also, we put a lot of attention in to thinking about what words to use and how to deliver that information in a just manner. And as you all know, this is always very difficult. Um, so I hope that we are, have been able to achieve that. And um, these are just some very basic data the randomization video was just released. Um, the Protecting Research uh, Volunteers page, the infographics, we haven't released it yet. We thought we were going to prior to this uh, meeting. Um, and then the other three videos, uh, we released them at the beginning of this year, and it's currently linked to, um, FDA has a patient um, site. So it's linked to that, it's linked, linked to clinicaltrials.gov. But we really, really want to more people to know about it. And from our point of view, as I have said, you know, because our only role at OHRP is to help make sure that research is done in an ethical manner and that subjects are protected. So this is where we are coming from. By no means are we trying to you know, make research more difficult, but I think that really our goal is to make people um, understand clearly what's, a, what's going on and make some decisions for themselves. And so, you know, 
I think many, many big institutions have developed similar sort of resources. Often they developed it from the perspective of thinking about recruitment and so on. I think that there is a slight difference in perspective. So I think that even for big institutions that may already have these sort of uh, resources, it will be useful, um, I think, to link um, their whatever their, where their resources are also to the OHRP website so that people can actually get a different perspectives or slightly different perspectives as well. Um, I think that's where um, I want, that's all I want to say and I want to thank you very much for your attention and I welcome you know, any um, comments you have. Um, currently we are thinking, we've just started to think about a different project. Uh, it's the project on use of data and biospecimens in research. Um, as you know, it's a very sensitive topic and, it's, um, and we need to handle it in, you know, in, a, in a just manner. So we only, we've only just started thinking about it. Um, and like I said, you know, we welcome any, any um, suggestions that you might have. And please, 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 all of you who are from institutions who work with IRB, do tell you know, your HRPP, your you know, investigators about this website do ask them to link to it so that that gives an, another, an additional opportunity, uh, an additional set of resources for um, potential research participants. And so with that, thank you very much. And I welcome any questions and comments. Thank you. Questions? Um, more of a comment than a question. One of the things that I think patients and the general public have a lot of difficulty with um, is probability. Yes. And, you know, you did a nice job explaining that it's what randomization is and that stressing, which I think is very important, that your doctor will not be choosing this based on your health. The only concern I had is when the coin flips, patients are allocated one Almost and equally, then the right? other. And, it, and that goes along with what a lot of patients and families believe. Mm -hmm. that, oh, if the person randomized before me got arm A, then this is a good time to join. I'm going to get arm B. Okay. And I don't know if there's a way to address that, make it very clear that that's not how this works. I, I, I just know from counseling patients, maybe mm -hmm. see families, have a kid with genetic disorder, and they're amazed when the next one also has it because they say, one and four, so we thought we'd have three. Yeah, we'll keep that in mind it. too, yeah. I mean, it, it, you brought up a very interesting point also, probability, right, and likelihood. Uh, that has been, well, it still is, uh, a topic that we want to tackle as well. I've been sitting on it, believe it or not, since last year, since about a year ago, and I'm still just, you know, distilling and thinking through what exactly do we want to convey? Because, I mean, the tendency sometimes is to go into a lot. I mean, I've looked at many videos online, and whether it be educating, like, you know, te teenagers, school children, or other, for other reasons, that they talk about, you know, uh, probabilities and, and, and likelihoods and things like that. And I just haven't found one that I think convey that information simply. I mean, the fact that I, you know, I worked, I worked in research and I worked in medicine and I did a lot of patient communication. I think that I'm trying to go back in those days and think about, okay, really what exactly do people, concern people? What is the simplest message that we can, um, you know, convey without getting them bogged down by, by all the, you know, the weeds of it, if you like. So I think that, um, yeah, it is definitely on our list of things that we want to cover how to cover it and um, in, in what way it's, it's difficult. Yeah, so we're still thinking about it. Yeah. Okay. We're now um, sort of in, uh, embracing behavioral studies as clinical trials. But this has a very medical focus. Yes. And um, I, I would be a little concerned with someone who is about to participate in a behavioral research trial watching this because it doesn't seem terribly relevant to them. It tells them that double blind is much better, but double blind is very difficult and unusual in behavioral trials in many cases. So it's not quite tuned to the direction that OHR, you know, that we're going. Yes. Um, 
I also wonder um, whether actually you're not talking about validity instead of reliability <laughs> in this. I mean, All I right, know so just that word, word that so just know, that word where we said, you know, it's, yeah. it's more reliable. More reliable. We like said they're wondering, okay, what simple English word? Yeah. Yeah, you know, so we, we, you. We, yeah, we, we <laughs> went through like accuracy, validity, but you see, when we, well, the moment we start really thinking about, you know, <laughs> mathematical terms, accurate scientific mathematical terms, we kind of like go away, and then people will start saying, well, but it's not that either, you know. It, it has been a struggle. Yeah. I no. Um, I, I'm not sure that I'm not sure that reliability is better understood than validity, and I think validity. Well, is and I, I think we are not. We weren't using about. the word reliability either. We just used Whatever. it more general. Like, is it more reliable? I think we try to keep it at a more general level. So I think if investigators or researchers are going to look at this and say, "Well, but that's not quite accurate," yeah, we agree. I mean, how, I mean, question is, how do you keep it at a you know, level eight, if not educational level eight, or below level that still conveys the information that is kind of sufficiently, you know, that people get it, if you like. I mean, the other thing I want to come back and say, yes, we I totally understand that these are more biomedical centered. And I think for the obvious reasons. I mean, we only started this project. We started thinking about this project um, last year, around so 2016, around April time. And the reason was because we have this migration of OHRP website from the old one to the newer look. So that's when we started off thinking maybe we really should do something now. So, And then by January, by federal government um, standard, that's pretty prompt, that we were able to develop the first three videos. And of course, you know, like I said, this is an ongoing continuous project. We, we tackled some of the topics that we think are probably, if you like, maybe associated with more, most of the risks that we might see um, or, or have kind of a more complicated, if you like. Um, you know, and, and I think that's why we started with clinical research. We definitely understand that there, in this world there is a lot of social behavioral research and sometimes they have different risk levels as well. So yes, we will move forward and, and, and think about those ones as well. Uh, going for, but please give us a please give us yeah, you know suggestions. Sure. Are, are you incorporating any cognitive testing as you develop these? Are you showing them to? I don't know that we want to go into too much details about actual scientific instruments. No, no. Are you testing them as you develop them? For oh. example, by by with focus groups or cognitive no, testing. No, we we don't really have the them. resources to do okay. that. We have a we get a limited uh, group stakeholders to comment on it. But I think that for all, those of you who have worked in the government, you know that there are limitations to that as well. We hope, actually, but we that, hope that, that out, outside. That is, that is a shame, though. That's a, that's a missed opportunity, I think. But you know what we hope? We hope that people will pick this up and actually do some studies on it to see if it actually makes a difference. I mean, this was how it actually, the, this idea was how it actually got started. That, you know, would it make any difference? You know, people should probably go about and consider studying it. And so we often read about the co coin toss in informed consents. You know, why not um, include something that it actually instructs how it's done? Yes, yes. Um, so if you notice that in the infographics, we have five sets and we start talking about what the regulations are. You know, we mention the words, terms like institution review board, informed consent, that kind of thing. Um, we have already, we think that that might be a platform to take it to somewhere else. So everything that we do now are kind of like building blocks, um, hoping to, you know, things will spin off from them. And definitely, yes, um, we have thoughts about doing something with informed consent. And then we were looking through our archives and we fished out this old VHS that was done way back when, you know, OHRP wasn't even OHRP, it was back in NIH. And it was a, you know, it was a three parts video that was filmed by the National Library of Medicine with Pelle featuring Pellegrino explaining about, you know, the, the role of institution review board and, you know, how that is done. And, you know, in spite of the picture being kind of old, if you like, 
it was really, really well done. I mean, you know, being Pellegrino, of course, you know, he was able to bring out, you know, how this, what people need to look at and think about. Talked about, you know, informed consent, what people need to think about, why it's important, in a way that is very sensible, if you like, very, very, uh, very informative. So, so we we revitalized, we resuscitated that video basically, and we digitized it and put, you know, we have to put captions and things like that. So that is, you know, from the infographics, that would be a link that would take that could take people to understanding that part. And of course, over time, you know, depending on, you know, resources and 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 uh, interests, we will try to develop things that uh, also complement, uh, whether it be informed consent or. IRBs or, or other things. Referring, excuse me, I was specifically referring to the randomization process. You know, just having the link quickly explain. <clears throat> there isn't somebody in the back room tossing coins. Oh, 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 right. okay. Um, I also I looked through the other videos, um, and some things came to. Um, just stood out. Um, in what is research, you have ways to improve educational programs, and I, you know, I, I, <clears throat> I realize you're not going to make any changes at this point, but I don't think a lot of patients really appreciate the amount of training of doctors and scientists that go on that goes on there, and that improving educational programs to me is so vague, it doesn't really point to training young doctors or new doctors or new scientists. <clears throat> and then in clinical trials, um, you mentioned use blood taken for other care. And that's something I, I mean, I never see, right? In clinical trials, they ask for blood on a schedule. It's not blood that's used for other care. So I was really surprised why you, why you put that in. Okay. Um, I can't remember exactly what's in the script, but we'll go back and look at it. I, actually, we welcome any of this. If you want to just, you know, point it out, then we'll have a look. Thank you. So I have a couple of comments. Then we can, uh, but but so I first of all, it may not be perfect, but I think it's wonderful, <laughs> and it seems very appropriate that it be on the OHRP website. Um, I would like you to think about a placeholder for the future, a video about IRBs. So even in the subtext of randomization. I think it needs to be said that someone has looked at these two arms and seen the risk and benefit and such, and, and no one knows about IRB. Mm -hmm. So I think that would be very useful to the mm -hmm. public. And then the other question is whether we can use those 21 or 30 questions in the printed list as a guide to the concise summary for the consent. <laughs> it does cover all oh. the elements, I have to say. <laughs> No, thank you. I think that's a, you know, this is a great, obviously we all, there are many, you, you've you um, teased us a little bit in that there's so much that we would love to see here, but this is a wonderful beginning. Thank, thank you very much, yep. yes. I, I applaud your efforts as well. I think it's excellent, and I, and I hope you build on it. Yes, we definitely will. We, we, we have great uh, aspiration for this project. We really think that, you know, we have a responsibility and I think we are really in a unique position to try and provide information. But as you all know, it's, it's, it's not as simple, straightforward. And I think that we'll try to balance it out as much as possible so that the information is valuable. I also think it's really good. And, you know, I'm th even thinking of my, like, eight-year-old. I think he would get it, right? It's very clear, but it's not dumbed down. So I applaud your efforts and have two suggestions for what might be additional helpful videos. Um, so, but would be really challenging. Um, one on equipoise, I think, would be very helpful and fits nicely into the randomization. Yes. You know, why are we doing the, it, it, and it okay. might be in the, um, what is research yes, module? I yes, didn't, yes, um, yes. Didn't look at that one in advance. Um, but just to help people understand that we really don't know the answer to the mm -hmm. question, um, which is why it's okay mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. randomize mm -hmm. you. And then I noticed in um, in the video you just showed, there was um, an equation that research is not the same as clinical care, which is something that I have in my own slides when I present on these mm -hmm. things and um, in educational settings. But I've started to take it out 
because of the move to learning health system and the blurring of the lines between research and clinical care. And okay. so that might be something that you could work into the data investments um, topic, although that's obviously um, really rich in and of itself, but just to help people understand that um, it might be uh, helpful or important to use their clinical data for research purposes and that the line is a little bit blurry, but it's a more complicated topic. Yes, and I, I think that we will probably do a bit of more of that too when we start tackling this business about using people's data and biospecimens for research. Thank you, thank you for mentioning that, Holly, because it stood out for me as well, especially in cancer clinical trials, when so much effort is made to have both arms get the standard of care, plus or minus the investigational agent, right? So everybody really is getting what, what standard care is. And mm -hmm. also introducing that term, standard of care. Because you, you have a few ways of <laughs> approaching. You have new drug. The new drug and the, and the uh, investigational drug are both red and white capsules. Okay. They look the same. All right. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you I so think much. we could go on with there. This is just great, really. Um, but we'll, we have to move on to our second topic. Um, as soon as our speaker is ready. So Mark Barnes, the HIPAA exemption from the Subcommittee on Harmonization. Good morning, everybody. Um, so we have a we have the riveting topic of the HIPAA exemption to discuss today. <laughs> um, the uh, Marissa Gordon Wen is uh, is here also from uh, from OCR, and so if uh, at any point, Marissa, if you want to, Marissa, if you want to come sit up here, you're welcome to sit up here because there may be questions that that you will be well poised to answer. So, so the, here's. The subcommittee did not come up with this project on its own. The subcommittee was asked by OHRP to look at the HIPAA exemption in the same way that, that we were asked to look at the broad consent, although please, I hope this is less controversial <laughs> than the broad consent. Uh, the, um, we were asked to look at the HIPAA exemption, and I'll describe what it is in, in a moment, and try to, try to identify problems that, uh, that might exist in interpreting the provision for a new uh, so-called HIPAA exemption, and then make recommendations that would uh, that SACRP could either either uh, adopt, ignore, or change, uh, and and make on to uh, the HHS secretary in regard to how best to interpret the HIPAA exemption. And there are some real uh, uh, ambiguities in the in the HIPAA exemption, as you'll see. Uh, we tried to we spent a good deal of time on this. We have a guidance document, which is in draft form, which is available to you. I think you were, it was sent as part of the meeting materials, <coughs> and it's also uh, available outside in printed, uh, in printed copy, which is somewhat lengthy. I'm going to, um, I have a PowerPoint, and what I'm going to do is go through the issues thematically with you so that I can, uh, with using the PowerPoint, to explain uh, what, uh, what we've done, what we've recommended, and, and why. Um, so just a, a couple of, of uh, words of, of background here. HIPAA is, when it, when, it first, when it first came into effect in 2001, 2002, the, um, many of us realized that in research with humans that we would have to, in our covered entity institutions, which are largely, but for these purposes, but not entirely healthcare providers, also includes health plans and some other um, substance abuse treatment agencies, perhaps, and others that do one or more electronic uh, reimbursement transactions. The, uh, we realized that we would have to co comply not only with the common rule for federally funded research, but also we would have to comply with HIPAA. And so there were many, uh, there were many, there was much commentary at the time. Uh, NIH uh, has specific commentary that's published on its website in regard to how to apply HIPAA uh, to uh, and read the HIPAA requirements along with, um, along with the common rule requirements. Uh, OCR has, uh, has many FAQs and put out guidance itself on how to apply HIPAA in the, uh, re in the, in the context of research with, uh, with living human beings. And the, um, so 
what is somewhat odd about this exemption is really the following, and let me just start with this, which is that this is an exemption under the revised common rule. It is not an exemption under HIPAA. So even if, your, if the research that we're going to discuss today, the category of research, fits under the common rules HIPAA exemption, that is an exemption from the common rule. It is not an exemption from HIPAA, <laughs> just to be clear about this. Um, I think that there could easily be um, confusion given that the terminology is the HIPAA exemption, which sounds as though it's an exemption from HIPAA when it's not. So uh, with that, let me, uh, let me go into, um, into, the, uh, into the PowerPoint. This is the, uh, the actual text of the revised common rule that we are discussing today. And let me just let me uh, bear with me while I while I read it for those who are on the um, on the simulcast. This is secondary research for which consent is not required. Secondary research uses of identifiable private information or identifiable biospecimens if at least one of the following criteria is met. And then there are four different uh, uh, possibilities here. We are focused on the third one. The third one is this. Secondary research, so just to go back to the square one, secondary research uses of identifiable private information or identifiable biospecimens if the research involves only information collection and analysis involving the investigator's use of identifiable health information when that use is regulated under the HIPAA privacy rule for the purposes of healthcare operations or research as those terms are defined in HIPAA or public health activities as defined in HIPAA. So this is, the, this is what we have to interpret. Now where did this come from? The idea in the preamble to the, uh, to the, in the commentary in the, uh, in the final rule basically says that when research with humans <clears throat> is subject both to HIPAA and to the common rule, and involves secondary use of identifiable data. So these are data that were already collected. There are no prospective research interventions with these individuals. Secondary use of already collected data, identifiable data. When that exists, the primary risk uh, to the individuals is one of violation of privacy. The reasoning goes, and I, I happen to agree with it, but you don't have to, uh, that because HIPAA ha is a very strong and rigorous and robust protection for identifiable data so that those data cannot be misused or disclosed to others who don't have a right to, uh, to have access to them and to use those data, because HIPAA exists, it is adequate to protect the privacy rights of individuals so that there is no reason to require simultaneous jurisdiction by the common rule and ultimately by uh, review and approval, usually using waiver of, uh, of consent by an IRB. That's the theory, okay? And it is true, and I, I don't mean to say that skeptically, it is true. The common rule is basically has administrative uh, uh, potential sanctions that is ultimately HHS can, can revoke funding. HHS could even bar someone from, from getting future funding uh, for human subjects research activities if they if they if the institution and the individuals engaged in gross violations of the common rule. In HIPAA, it is much more robust in terms of the sanctions that are that are possible. Marissa could tell you, but I mean it's possible to to spend time in the federal penitentiary for violating uh, HIPAA. And so the theory is that HIPAA actually is not only as protective as the common rule in these ways, it actually is more protective in these ways. So so I'm going to now go into the, into the ambiguities, but Marissa, do you want to add anything to that? No, I think that's a fair introduction, just to note that my agency, uh, HHS, enforces uh, civil penalties for violations, and there are criminal penalties, however, which are heard about less often, but that's uh, enforced by the Department of Justice. Okay, so to proceed, <clears throat> This is the commentary uh, that is the relevant commentary in the preamble to the, the January 19th, 2017 revision. 
and it basically says what I uh, what it, this is the the text of what uh, what I just uh, summarized for you conceptually. These are the issues that we that we identified, and then I'm going to take you through each of the issues, explain what the issue is, and explain what we recommended and why. What I would suggest, um, Stephen, if this is okay with you, is that is that I'll present each issue. And then if there are questions about that issue, let's stop there and take the questions rather than waiting until the end. Otherwise, you'll become terribly confused, okay, as, as will I. These are the issues. When is this HIPAA exemption available for collaborative research? That is research involving two separate research teams in two separate HIPAA-covered entities, like two hospital systems, for example, to take the, the easiest example. And remember, the HIPAA exemption is only available to, to researchers who are working within institutions that are covered entities under HIPAA. Just remember that. So many social service settings are not settings that are, they're not institutions that are covered entities under HIPAA. So this is primarily biomedical in its application. The second issue is consideration of business associates under the exemption. Uh, when an entity is a um, is when when a covered entity is asking a non-covered entity to do functions to assist in functions that fall under the categories of treatment payment or healthcare operations, and the entity assisting is not already a covered entity under HIPAA, it is required to uh, to be bound by a business associate agreement so that by implication by contract the jurisdiction of HIPAA extends to the non-covered entity so that the data, the, PA, the protected health information, is still protected when the, when the index organization covered entity shares with the non-covered entity. So the question is, how do business associates work? Does that, do, do they enjoy the HIPAA exemption too for, for the kinds of things, that, the kinds of research that they may want to do either independently or in, in collaboration with the covered entity that, uh, that gave them the, that bound them by the business associate agreement. The third issue is whether this exemption, this HIPAA exemption, applies only to identifiable data or whether the HIPAA exemption also applies to identifiable biospecimens to allow the downstream use within covered entities of identified, identifiable biospecimens. That's, that's the question. Four is... Um, what about information, uh, identifiable information, that is added to a registry or the database or added to the, uh, the, the, uh, the data after the, the, the initial secondary research use under this exemption? That is, when you have a cohort of patients that's moving through time, you may apply the HIPAA, ex as a researcher, you may seek and apply and gain use of the HIPAA exemption at point X, but what about X plus one year? Can you then go back and collect the data between X and X plus one year and then add those data when those data were captured, were obtained, not because of any research intervention that you did? These were data that were going to be captured anyway. So that's the question is the kind of the, the temporal element here and how it applies. The fifth is to understand why it is that this exemption, and let me just go back to the language of the exemption, why does this exemption reference healthcare operations and public health activities when research as a defined term under both the HIPAA privacy rule and the common rule, it is word for word the same? So this is something that puzzled us. We have a resolution to it, but it was a question that we, that we certainly raised. The sixth is whether one can use this exemption in combination with other, uh, with other exemptions in order to combine data and use those data together in a, uh, in a research study. And seven is, is how other legal requirements intersect with this. And when we mean other legal requirements, I mean, let's list them out. Remember that HIPAA itself always applies to these data because we're talking about entities, by definition, that are covered entities under HIPAA. So HIPAA will apply to all the data, the PHI, the, the identifiable health data 
that we're about to uh, to discuss. What is that thing going off? <laughs> okay, I didn't know what it was. Um, the um, I thought Jerry was telling me to be quiet. <laughs> um, the uh, so but, so here's the question. And so the common rule would not apply. HIPAA would apply. But what about all the other laws out there about genetic testing and genet the use and disclosure of genetic information, the use and disclosure of tuberculosis information, substance abuse and alcoholism treatment regulations, all of those things may apply to these data. They're not, you don't get exempted from those things just because there is access to the so-called HIPAA exemption. So how does all that work together? So these were the questions that we, that we, uh, that we identified. So I'm going to take them one at a time, and I also have some handy graphics to explain some of this to you, <laughs> which I have to say I was, um, I, I'm a complete, um, completely inept at graphics, but uh, a young man who works with me named Manal Caron uh, graciously uh, did these graphics for us, so I think that you will appreciate them when they come up. They're quite animated. Anyway, the, um, so here is the, here's the, here the, here's the problem, and then we'll, go into, the, uh, into, into how, how perhaps to solve it. The HIPAA exemption is, an, is, by its terms, is an exemption that applies to one researcher or team of researchers within one covered entity. There is a difference in HIPAA between the, the term disclosure and the term use. If you will look at the, again, back at the, at the text of, the, of this, it says, when the use is regulated, not the disclosure, it says the use. Now, what's the difference between a use and a disclosure? A disclosure is, is the, the sending of protected health information outside of the covered entity that has it to another entity or another person who is outside, who is not on the workforce of that particular covered entity. That's a disclosure. So for one hospital to send information to another hospital or to a university researcher or to the RAND Corporation, all of that is a disclosure. If it's PHI, if it's a covered entity that has PHI. A use, on the other hand, is what the covered entity does with the information, not by disclosing it outside, but by using the information inside. And remember that use is only permitted by a covered entity of PHI it has to treat patients, to do its own healthcare operations like quality assurance and to bill third party payers. That's what it's allowed to do. In some cases, it's required to do other things by law, like report diseases, for example, by name. That, those are other uh, exceptions. But a use is what happens within a covered entity. A disclosure is the sending of PHI outside of a covered entity. Okay? So, the, um, so this, let me uh, give you the graphic here. So, let's say that we have two covered entities. For this purpose, so we will call them Mercy Hospital. Do, do I, is, this, is this pointer work, Cecilia? Oh, it does. Can, can you see it? Yeah, okay. Good. Thanks. So uh, we have two covered entities in this hypothetical. Mercy Hospital, Mercy being a quality of all religions. I thought that was actually, um, it was actually a religious. <laughs> to use that, and Northern Medical Center. Both of them contain PHI that the researchers would like to use. And the, and the, two, and the, um, and the two research teams, one within Northern Medical and one within Mercy Hospital, would like to be able to combine their data, and they'd like to be able to do the research with their combined data set. I'm giving you a simple hypothetical. More likely, in the, in the, day, in the, the day and age of big data and real-world real evidence, we're looking at 15,000 healthcare providers potentially combining their data or something like that. Okay. So, when they want to, the, the investigators are within these two, these two organizations. And remember, when they want to use the information, the PHI, for research, they have access under the common rule to the exemption, to the HIP, so-called HIPAA exemption, but they still need to comply with HIPAA. So in order to use those data, those PHI, for their own research project, in this case within Mercy Hospital, forget about Northern for a second, 
this investigator has got to apply to his or her IRB or privacy board for a waiver of HIPAA authorization to allow him or her to use the data for the research. So they've already got to go to an IRB or privacy board in order to get a waiver of authorization. That's the process they have to go through, and then they have to meet the requirements for a waiver of authorization, which essentially is that the use of the data would be minimal risk to the individuals. It's more complicated than that, but that's the bottom. That's really the, the, the simplification of it. So this guy or woman over here has already got to go to the privacy board, even forgetting about any other covered entity being involved, okay? And then they can get the exemption to use the under the common rule so they would not have to go to the IRB and actually apply with a full research protocol and ask for a waiver of consent. Then if Northern wants to use the information, the PHI, for its own research project, it also would have to go to its IRB or central IRB or central privacy board in order to get the same thing. And then it would have access to the exemption for its own data. Its own researchers could use its own data without having to go to an IRB and seeking waiver of consent and approval of the protocol under the common rule. Now, how do we, if these two investigators have similar research interests and want to combine the data sets, though, how do we affect the sharing of PHI for collaborative research between the two entities, the two covered entities? Because the exemption, by its terms, only, only talks about use, not about disclosure. And we've still got to obey HIPAA. So how do we do this? Well, the way that we do this is we... This researcher, when he or she wants to apply for the waiver of authorization to use the PHI within Mercy Hospital, would also be applying for a waiver of authorization to disclose the same PHI to the other HIPAA-covered entity. They, would, they could seek that at the same time. They could seek it separately, but why not do it in one application to the, uh, to the, to the IRB or Privacy Board? This team would ask for its own waiver of authorization for the use, but it would also ask the IRB or Privacy Board for a waiver of authorization to, to allow it to disclose to the other covered entity for purposes of the collaborative research. This is the way that it would be affected in a way that would be completely consistent with HIPAA, which is what we have to obey because we're not exempt from HIPAA. The IRB or Privacy Board hopefully would grant each institution's request. And remember that under HIPAA, you're also allowed, one covered entity is allowed actually to, to it doesn't have to make its own decision to waive authorization to disclose or to use. It can accede to another, another covered entity's IRB or Privacy Board uh, making that determination itself. So one could use, my point is you could, you could either have one institution's IRB do all of this or you could have a central IRB do it if you wanted to. So the IRB or Privacy Board grants each institution's request for disclosure. And there you go, in the handy graphic, <laughs> permitting both investigators to use both institutions, PHI, in their research. So this is the... So, Going back to the spirit of all of this, to the spirit of the exemption, which is that we don't need the common rule to apply as well when HIPAA already protects all of the uses of the information, that spirit, that purpose is not damaged by this because the data under this example never leave a HIPAA-covered entity. They never escape to a non-covered entity that would not be bound by all of the provisions and the protections of HIPAA, okay? So here's the recommendation. The exemption, this is what the subcommittee is recommending to you. The exemption can and should be read to extend to research in which researchers within one covered entity share PHI with research partners within a second covered entity so long as appropriate HIPAA authorization or waiver or alteration of authorization has been secured 
permitting the first entity to disclose the information to the second uh, collaborating covered entity. And then the, uh, I won't read this to you, but it's basically what, I, what, I have, uh, what I've been describing. And then at the bottom, once the disclosure of PHI from one covered entity to, other, to another has happened, most likely under a waiver of authorization, then all HIPAA re uh, requirements would continue to apply to all of the data, including the accounting requirement, because when PHI is disclosed from one entity to another, under a waiver of authorization, there is a requirement that the disclosing entity record the persons or entities to which it has disclosed so that the individual patient or client can request and get information about the entities to which or to whom his or her information has been disclosed. So the, this does not, the, my point here is HIPAA continues to apply and it also applies in regard to the accounting, of, accounting for disclosures if there's been a waiver of authorization granted. So let me stop there and see if there are, um, if there are questions or, or comments. So Mark, let me just ask a clarifying question. So that, that was wonderful. Thank you. Um, this was a very complicated topic, and I know the subcommittee struggled with it, and I think you've done a beautiful job of explicating it. If we weren't discussing the exemption, everything if this was not exempt research, but this is what you wanted to do to combine this data, everything you've sketched out to this point is a requirement. Yes. So I want right. everybody, because the, this level of complexity was new to me, I want everybody to be clear that SACARP and our you know, guideline process and all of this stuff is not creating this complexity. All Mark has done is actually document what you have to do now, whether or not you have the exemption. So all that the recommendation is is that the exemption should apply in this circumstance, but all of those other disclosures and uses and waivers, those are things that are required now whether or not you get the exemption. So I just think that that's worth <coughs> saying. Yes, it is worth saying. Yeah, thank um, you. Other comments or questions or thoughts? This is a very good point. Um, the, um, and let me step back because what I'm about to say actually applies to all of the determinations that, 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 make, that, that would operationalize the HIPAA exemption. And that is that, that uh, right now we have internal processes within our entities that are subject to the common rule and to HIPAA. We have the, we have the IRB and the IRB staff that is there to hold the toll gate for the use of the existing exemptions, assuming the institutional policy says that that's what the IRB is supposed to do. And most of our institutions, most of the institutions don't allow investigators to decide on use of an exemption by themselves. They want some submission of something to an IRB or to an IRB staff member or a chairperson to make sure that they've applied the exemption. I'm forget about the HIP exemption. I'm talking about the exemptions under the existing common rule. Uh, so. What this does, though, the, the HIPAA exemption in this case, it actually, it, is a, it, is, it accomplishes, which it's supposed to accomplish, the, um, the bypassing of the IRB's consideration of a full research protocol and the granting of a waiver of consent and the approval of the, and the, approval of the actual protocol. Therefore, it calls upon the institutional administrators of research as well as either the Privacy Board or the IRB if it is acting in the role of, um, of, of a Privacy Board under HIPAA, it is required that they would exercise some kind of discretion to make sure that the investigator within our Mercy Hospital example is actually applying the HIPAA exemption in the right way. In other words, you know, one of the things that has scared many of us, because many of us have had bitter experiences with it, has been investigators going off on their own for years before HIPAA ever came along, doing a study and then saying, oh, it was exempt. I never bothered to tell anybody because it was exempt. And then they publish it and then all hell breaks loose because it actually was, a, it was an incorrect interpretation of the exemption, application of the exemption. 
The same thing could happen here if, we, if institutions on their own don't put into place certain procedures to make sure that this HIPAA exemption with all its complexity is actually applied by investigators in the right way. So there is a need, and, I, and thank you for raising the question because I should have actually started with that. There is a need for institutions in applying the exemption to make sure that there are internal processes to make sure that the exemption is being applied in the correct way. Okay. So I'm just curious. So one possibility here is you think of this data be sort of residing within a healthcare system and staying within that system. So as someone who's been hacked in every single hack, including UCLA's, I'm not wildly excited about this idea, but whatever. Um, but actually an institution can be, someone can be a researcher in a covered entity, but in fact they're using the data outside of the healthcare system. Or can that be true? In other words, suppose, suppose you're at a university and you have a university hospital and therefore the university the, the what is the covered entity? Is it the university as a whole? Is it the hospital? How far does the coveredness extend within the entity? Um, well, each university, I mean, this is, a, this is a common question, actually, because, you know, we have universities, we have many universities that have medical schools. Right. And public health schools and nursing schools and pharmacy schools. We have many universities that own the medical centers and that are integrated academic medical center models. There are others, like the most recent spinoff at Vanderbilt of where the, you know, the hospital separated itself from the university, whereas where the university is actually a completely separate entity. When a, an entity like a kind of more typical university has a medical school faculty that also treats patients and has a hospital, that university will have gone through, in the drafting of its HIPAA compliance plan, a determination that would be enshrined in some kind of HIPAA declaration or policy, an SOP, that would say, these parts of our institution we regard as a covered entity under HIPAA, whereas these other parts, like the Greek and Latin department, the, um, the epidemiology department, and others, are not regarded as a covered entity under HIPAA. In, under this exemption, this particular exemption, an investigator who is part of the covered entity piece of the larger so-called hybrid entity, he or she would only be able to use the information within within the covered entity portion of the hybrid entity. In other words, they couldn't take it out and show it to graduate students in epidemiology unless there had been some kind of waiver of authorization that allowed them to do that. So I, I guess one thing I was assuming is that part of HIPAA is the actual adequate protection of the data, the application of sufficient protection, say encryption, things that, that prevent and, and, and identify attempts to get into systems and so on. Right. And so is there some, I mean, you're, you're sort of speaking to the disclosure part of it, but is there something in here that speaks to the data protection part of it? There, there is because by definition, a HIPAA-covered entity is required to abide by all of these various protections like the encryption technology and other things. That's the, that's the, um, the security rule which applies to all of these entities as well. So they're already required to have uh, disaster recovery programs and, and firewalls and user access systems and limited access, the expiration of access when a person leaves the workforce, you know, is terminated or, or, um, or, or departs voluntarily. So all of that is, is assumed in what I'm talking about. So when someone wants to invoke this um, exemption, who considers that question of where these data that are going to be disclosed are going to be residing and who will be able to use them and disclose them to others. Where does that decision get made? Because that seems like a critical decision, particularly in these hybrid systems. Yeah. The, it gets made, I think, in, in, it gets made in three places. One is the investigator is already, it can't have access to this unless he or she is a member of the workforce of a covered entity. So they are bound personally to abide by HIPAA in all the things that they do. And so they have to make that decision themselves because if they make the wrong decision, they can be at some personal risk. The second would be that the 
IRB or privacy board that is making the, the that it has to, the, I, you've got to go, the researcher has got to go to the IRB or privacy board to get a waiver of authorization in order to be able to effectuate the HIPAA exemption under the common rule. They've got to be able to do that, unless they have actually have a broad waiver, a, a broad authorization that was that was actually signed by the individuals long ago, which is unlikely in, the, in these, but it's possible in these situations. So the IRB or privacy board will look at the proposed waiver and they will see exactly, you know, whether it, they think that it's, it's, um, it poses a, a more than a minimal risk to the person or not. The third person that has to make the decision is actually the covered entity itself because some administrator within the covered entity needs to say, oh, this is an accurate and appropriate application of the HIPAA exemption to this particular research activity. And he or she has to do that, first of all, because of, you know, good academic oversight. You want that, and compliance oversight, you want that to happen. But also, the covered entity is the one that is liable as well as a, as a corporate entity if the individual misuses, the individual researcher misuses or misdiscloses the information, the PHI, and violates HIPAA. So all three of those kind of stars have to align. Is this going to be covered in the guidance at all? I mean, I, I think you probably assume that organizations that are covered under HIPAA are fully aware of this. But it's something that I think perhaps you want to re-raise in the guidance document. Because yeah. my experience is that, I don't know if privacy boards are different, because I don't run a privacy board. But IRBs are very different in their the degree to which they cover actual issues of data security. Right. Uh, many, some do, very few do but many don't. And so I wonder if you need to re-raise these questions again, because it's some fairly sensitive parsing of yeah. interpretation. Well, I, I, would, I would commend everyone's attention to, to page five of the guidance document, because we actually have a couple of lengthy paragraphs about this very issue, about the need to, um, the need to essentially to make the existing mechanisms much more robust if an institution is going to take advantage of this, precisely for the, for the reasons that you raise. Marissa, did you want to add anything to that? Only that I, I think it might be helpful to conceptualize these hybrid entities um, for folks to think of them as a covered entity and an outside entity. So even within one institution, if you're hybridized, you have your covered entity in, and within that, the use would fall under the HIPAA exemption. But any sharing of information to other parts of the institution that are not part of the covered component is not a use, it's a disclosure. And so that has to have its own permission and it wouldn't, and any use by you know, the folks outside of the HIPAA component would not be a use under this exemption. Hopefully that makes sense. But I think in this hybridized system, it's, um, it's confusing to think about disclosure as something that goes from one kind of person to another kind of person because the people are, are hybridized too. So you have a joint appointment in the School of Medicine and the School of Public Health. But the School of Public Health is outside the HIPAA system and the School of Medicine is within the HIPAA system. So an individual has to be understanding that they can't move their data from one place to another place, and they have to organize their research teams in the appropriate kind of ways. It just is, con it's complicated, very complicated. It's true, and I think that, you know, the, the balance between allowing the flexibility for an individual workforce member to wear <laughs> different hats <laughs> um, is, you know, it, it has to be accompanied by um, understanding by them of what they can do when they're wearing one hat or the other one as far as using the information um, for their although, different Although activities. they have to do that right now, even right, without the right. HIPAA exemption, right? Because the same thing is, all of this is going on without the HIP, HIPAA exemption being applied, yeah. Mark, can I ask you if you um, know how many, it, do the majority of institutions use their IRBs as the privacy board? That was sort of my experience, and I see you're nodding. Yeah. So, you know, because one of the things when I was reading this, and, and um, I found it very challenging. Yeah. 
And I say that as somebody, I am a lawyer. I have left most of the details, except as it relates to HIPAA, you know, to others. But, um, but I was struck partly by the complexity that why would somebody use this, given if the, if the privacy board is the IRB, and I heard you express it actually best here, which is it's sort of the encouragement to the IRB, don't go through the rest of this, be, you know, don't ask those other questions about the protocol because it's within the HIPAA system. And I think it would be um, perhaps helpful to, to be explicit about that because um, I also found your, the, um, or your associates, uh, graphics to be helpful, again, to, to get through. We might want to include them. Yeah. But to explain, there's, there really is, this is a complicated thing. Again, not because of anything except it's a complicated thing. Yeah. But there are, there is a reason to think very hard about setting this up, and that is really to take full advantage of this without having to go through some of the other things that we might otherwise go. Yeah. Um, because otherwise it was like, well, if we're going through, as I've always understood it, basically the same assessment for waiver of consent, but we're sort of saying it to the IRBs, but you don't have to go into the other things you might otherwise have gone into. Right. Because yeah. we're saying it's already in this system that is working. The, um, I mean, my, my impression has always been that of all the entities that I've ever, uh, for which I've ever done work myself, I would say that, you know, 19 out of 20 don't have a separate privacy board. They use the IRB as the privacy board. I don't know, Marissa, if that's your experience as well. I'm not actually sure about um, how, how that's uh, set up for the majority of institutions, although I have had some feedback just recently um, where folks are telling me that if they, they've always used the IRB for the privacy um, determination uh, for a waiver, but because they no longer need the IRB to make the, um, the, to do the full review or an expedited review, to remove burden from the IRB, they're thinking about setting up a privacy board uh, instead of continuing to use the IRB the way they used to. So I don't know to what extent uh, institutions are thinking about this, but I have heard it from a couple of different people that that's a possibility. The last thing I would say is that, you know, th th let me tell you the alternative here. The alternative to this recommendation is that we limit the exemption to the use of, of one research team within one covered entity, and that's it. Which actually, you know, for this day and age, doesn't really it doesn't really help anybody, frankly, because it's the combination of data that, that really matters, so. And Mark, the shared data under the current circumstances without the exemption is still covered by HIPAA, so you have all those protections. Exactly. Yeah. So it seems common sense. Yeah, so, okay. I'm gonna go on to the second point then, if that's okay. Stephen, is that okay? <clears throat> Okay, issue two. A business associate, uh, as, I, as I described uh, briefly before, is an entity that performs one of the recognized business associate functions under HIPAA regulations on behalf of a HIPAA-covered entity. These kinds of activities can include the activity of actually de-identifying de PHI. In other words, you can hire a data company to look at your protected health information as a hospital system and de-identify those data, that would be a business associate operations function. You can use a business associate to prepare a limited data set. You can use it, a business associate, to do data aggregation of all of your data and, and cull the data and sort the data. And you can also use external organizations, as many hospitals do, to conduct utilization reviews and also quality assurance reviews. These are all kinds of business associate activities and when a covered entity, hospital, or health system decides to use a data company to do any of these things, or a quality assurance company or consulting firm to do these kinds of things, remember that the data company and the quality assessment consulting company, they are not billing third-party payers themselves for services they render, so they are not covered entities under HIPAA. So the only way to, for a hospital to give, to disclose all of its PHI to this non-covered entity is by binding the covered entity with a business associate agreement. 
And actually, I'll tell you historically, how long have you been at, at OCR, Marissa? Eight years. Okay. So this was drafted, these, just by way of historical explanation so that you understand why this is, not a, um, this, is, this is not an historical accident that this happened. What happened was this. When people were sitting around in the last days of the Clinton administration drafting the HIPAA privacy rule, and they realized that the jurisdiction of the HIPAA privacy rule was really contingent on electronic transactions for reimbursement purposes. Then they, and they started thinking about what a hospital, well, that, that gave them jurisdiction over all the hospitals, basically, except a few Shriners hospitals that actually don't bill third-party payers. And some dental practices and psychiatry practices and dermatology practices that only accept cash or check. Those are not covered entities under HIPAA, okay? But they're looking at, you know, 99% of the American healthcare system, which is all of which are covered entities under HIPAA, and they realize, oh, but the business operations of all of these entities extend to the TV companies that come in and put the TVs in the hospitals. They extend to the quality assurance consulting firms. They, the utilization review agents are not covered entities under HIPAA, but they're getting all of these data. But we don't have jurisdiction to impose HIPAA directly on all of these entities because they're not doing electronic transactions themselves for reimbursement purposes. So what do we do? Because if we can't cover them, it's a huge gap in the system. So being inventive regulators, the general counsel's office at, um, at uh, many of whom I, are friends of mine, including the, the former general counsel, they decided that what they would do is that instead of imposing, because they can't, they had, didn't have jurisdiction, HIPAA on these, in, these, these, this external ring directly, they would instead impose on the covered entities the obligation that if you want to contract with an outside entity, you must put in the contract that the outside entity is bound by HIPAA. So it is, it is applying jurisdiction to what you have in order to extend your jurisdiction to that which you don't have as of right. This is the way, this is the theory, this is how business associates came to be in the first place. Over the years, and I'll spare you the details, although I'm sure, Mar and Marissa knows it better than I do, but over the years, the business associate contract requirements have become more and more rigorous. So that today, a business associate is basically, when you decide as a non-covered entity to do business, to take money and do business with a hospital system or another covered entity, which can also be insurance plans, then you understand that you are going to have to sign this agreement which says that you are bound by the HIPAA rules in regard to the data that you get, the PHI that you get, and if you violate HIPAA, you are essentially subject to the same kinds of sanctions and penalties. So this is what a business associate is. I'll stop there in case you think that I said anything wrong. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so then the question becomes, yes? So can I just ask a question? Yeah. Those are functions in the first bullet. Those are different functions. Is there anything that relates to the purpose of those functions? In other words, why are you creating a de-identified data set? Why are you creating a limited data set? Is there anything that speaks to why you are doing that? Because you could be doing that, I guess, for quality control purposes, or you could be doing it for research purposes, or you could be treading the wavy line between those two. Right. Well, the, um, that's, a, that's a very good question, and it is, and I'll, I'll give you the, what I think the answer is that Marissa can correct if I'm wrong, but um, it, it's, um, it, the answer is just the answer. I'm not sure that it's like, you know, that it has a lot of, um, you know, a, a, I mean, it has a certain internal logic, but basically a business associate is a, a non-covered entity that helps you do operations, treatment, and payment. I'm sorry, operations and, and payment, not treatment. If it's a treating entity, it's not two entities treating the same, covered entities treating the same patient. They can share data for the purpose of treating that patient. The, um, but if it's a business associate, then it's helping you perform either operations or uh, reimbursement functions. The process of de-identifying data or, or rendering identifiable data into a limited data set is regarded, and this is where it's just, it is what it is, is regarded as a business operation function, regardless of what the purpose is of de-identifying those data. So that's the answer to your question, and I mean, it's, you know, it's, one could, could have decided it the other way, but that's, that's what the test is. 
Yeah, I'll elaborate on that. Um, so, so the the data aggregation function is part of the definition of a business associate as a business associate function, whereas the the purpose behind what you're doing is regulated in a different part of the rule and has to do with permissions. So in the definition, it doesn't say, you know, what you can use and disclose or when for this data, data aggregation purpose. But based on the purpose, if they're doing it for healthcare operations um, or for a research uh, purpose, usually it's not going to be because research itself isn't a, um, a, a healthcare operation, um, then that's where, that's where the purpose comes in when you get to the permissions for use and disclosure. So you'll notice that what's left out here is that when one entity, when a covered entity wants to do one activity only, and that is research, with a non-covered entity, then the non-covered entity is not actually doing anything that requires it under HIPAA to have a, to be bound by a business associate agreement if it's pure research. So, so the question then became, and this is like the you know the question behind all of this is, well, if you are Mercy Hospital and you want your quality and you want an outside researcher in the epidemiology department or in the university down the street, you want that department of, of biostatistics to do your research, can you just bind them with the business associate agreement, even though all they're doing is helping you do research, and that way you can, you can pull them into your HIPAA-covered entity to use this exemption? Could you do that? So we debated that a lot, back and forth. And basically, this is what, the, the decision was sort of made for us by Marissa. And, her, and, and the, an, the good answers that she gave, because Marissa basically said, and correct me if I'm wrong, she said, you can't just do that and, and when, when the purpose, when the only purpose outside is research, because research is not an activity that requires a business associate agreement, and so we at OCR would not recognize, even if you signed a, B, a BAA, we wouldn't recognize that as a legitimate BAA function. And so we wouldn't enforce it that way against the non-covered entity. So if that's the case, then our, from our point of view as a subcommittee, we couldn't, even if we wanted to, recommend that you could just bind the outside covered entity by BAA and pull them in and everybody is happy with the exemption. Sure. Um, and I just want to clarify that you can put together a, something that looks like a business associate agreement. That's essentially a contract with uh, someone else to whom you are disclosing information. It's just that you can't, and then, then they'll be contractually liable to you, but you can't, as a covered entity, make another outside, non-covered entity subject to our enforcement. Unless they're a business associate. Unless they're a real business, a real business associate. So, Mark, why don't you go through this question, too, because I think we're already getting to the... To the meat of it. To the meat of it. Yeah, we are. We are getting to the meat of it. So, so, um, so, so, oh, I have a handy graphic for this, too. <laughs> I forgot about this graphic. Okay. So, <laughs> so, let me use the graphic <laughs> to illustrate. Um, so, we have Mercy Hospital, our friend Mercy Hospital over here, and, which has PHI, and then you have a data corporation over here. So can Mercy transfer PHI to Data Corp to perform business associate functions? Of course it can. Real business associate functions. It can disclose the PHI over here. And it does that if business associate agreement functions are authentic. And that's my term. That's not a HIPAA term. And Mercy and Data actually enter into an appropriate business associate agreement that has all the bells and whistles that are required under the various uh, under the various HIPAA regulations and amendments there too. So this is allowed, right? Now, subsequent to the activities described in the previous slide, which were conducted, let me go back to the, let me just go back for a second. So remember the previous slide was, was a true BAA function. Let's say in that example, the data corporation was assisting with quality assurance and real world evidence activities for the learning health system as a quality assurance mechanism. Subsequent to the activities described in the previous slide, which are conducted consistent with HIPAA requirements, 
Can Mercy and Data Corporation then use PHI under the exemption for common research? In other words, the covered entity went to the data corporation and said, can you help us assess this quality assurance problem by looking at all of our data? And the covered entity says, yes, give us the BAA, bind us, we'll do the work for you. They do it. They have a startling finding. They decide that, in fact, the, that one particular approach to a surgical operation or infection control was incredibly useful. So they want to look at, at the data again for this purpose or at more data from Mercy Hospital for this purpose. So subsequent to the truly authentic business associate activities, can these two entities then engage in common research under the HIPAA exemption? Yes, all the research activities handled by data fall under legitimate HIPAA jurisdiction, OCR jurisdiction, because of the truly, the true, biz, the true, the authentic business associate activities. Now, what about the situation in which Mercy Hospital and a university decide that they would like to, this hospital decides it wants to take, and this fancy investigator decides that he or she wants to take advantage of the fabulous new HIPAA exemption and use it to bring in a co-investigator at a non-covered entity, which could also be the, the, the non-covered part of the hybrid entity in our, in our public health school example. Can Mercy, under this system, transfer PHI to university to serve as a co-investigator, assuming the parties execute a business associate agreement? No, because the university and the co-investigator would not be serving as authentic business associates. Again, my term, not a HIPAA term. So disclosure not allowed in a business associate agreement. They can sign whatever they want, as Marissa said, and it can bind them privately, but it's not going to subject the non-covered, non-business associate co-investigator to the jurisdiction of OCR for these purposes. Okay, so this is the, this is, explains the two different scenarios here. Okay, so, I mean, I, I've been through this this week, <laughs> so it's very fresh in my mind. So, th it seems very peculiar to me that all of a sudden, because you have an authentic business associate agreement, you can then turn that into co-investigated research simply because you already had one. So it's sort of it, certain kinds of firms can then become research firms under this, whereas other kinds of firms can't because if you don't have a reason to have a business associate agreement, then you cannot do research under this, whereas if you do have a reason, then suddenly you can do research. Well, that seems somewhat peculiar to me. Well, you, you, but you can do the research now. I mean, you just right. need no, to I have a full that. IRB protocol with the waiver of consent. Yeah. No, I understand that. Yeah. So, um, but, but it is, seems a little peculiar that something turns itself around in, a, in an odd way. The other thing about these slides, because this is so utterly complicated, I have a feeling that if we put out guidance or if guidance is, appears, people will be extremely grateful. However, um, I, I think that covered entities may well interpret a slide like this not to say, no, you can't do this under a HIPAA waiver, but no, you can't do this. So my suggestion is that you alter this slide to say, no, you can't do it under a HIPAA waiver. Here's how you can do it. Just simply oh, add something that says, here's how you can do it. Well, yeah, the slides are not going to be part of the recommendation. They're, they're oh, okay. purely pedagogical. <laughs> okay, but, but as, as, as the recommendations evolve, yeah. I, I do think that what you're saying is extremely important to say, okay, here's how you can do it correctly. So I think it's important to say, here's how you can't do it correctly. Here's how you can do it correctly, just mm -hmm. as a reminder, these things already exist. Okay. So this is very helpful. So the recommendation here is basically the following. Given that an entity performing enumerated business associate functions, that is, in my terminology, authentic BA functions, under a BAA would be fully subject to the HIPAA privacy rule for its use of the data, we recommend, this is the subcommittee recommendation, that the HIPAA exemption should extend to secondary research in which the business associate is, by engaging in one of these business associate functions, participating alongside the covered entity in the research. But it's important to note that the recommendation does not extend to the following. Specifically, any extension of the HIPAA exemption to cover research-related activities carried out by business associates must be limited to activities considered to be business associate 
activities under HIPAA. The execution of a BAA with a covered entity is necessary, but that is between a covered entity and a non-covered entity, is a necessary but insufficient condition to permit a non-covered entity to participate in research for which the HIPAA exemption may otherwise be available. So that's the recommendation. So, Mark, I have just a, another question to try to clarify this, because what it seems to me you're saying <clears throat> is that you can be a business associate because you do a business associate transaction. And it could be, going back to your, uh, to your mercy example, it could be the quality assurance function. Um, but if you want to, if you find, have an interesting finding and you actually want to extend that data set by collecting additional information which you're not using for your HIPAA transaction, right. but which would be useful for the research, even though the business associate is doing the same thing with that data, if that data wouldn't have been disclosed under for the transactions that are part of the business associate agreement, it's not eligible for this exemption. Um, no, I would say the opposite, Stephen. Okay. Actually, I mean, I, th I mean, I'm, not that I would say. What, yeah. I, what, I, what I think the subcommittee meant is that once the authentic business associate relationship has been established, then remember that the BAA will then say to the non-covered entity that any of the PHI that it receives from the covered entity, it will, for that purpose, it will be bound by HIPAA. That's what it will. That's what the BAA will say. So that would include not only the initial bolus of data, but also any additional data. So what we're saying is that you could, the, the, under this interpretation, this recommendation, the covered entity could send after the BAA function has been finished, could send additional data of its PHI over, as long as the activity was somehow um, reasonably connected to the original business associate activities then they could so jointly think, take exemption. I think exam that's confusing. I don't know how to make it clear. I think it may just be no. confusing. So, um, you, so you need to establish the BAA under the auspices of a legitimate set of transactions. Right. Once it's established, you can't rely on HIPAA coverage for the BAA business associate for everything you do. In other words, you can't use them as an open research collaborator just because they're under a BAA. That's right. Even though that BAA is legitimate. Right. And you don't, but you don't have to limit it to just the material you used for the BAA. So right. there's, it's somewhere in between there, and yeah. I think defining that is kind of hard. I think it is too. I mean, I mean, I think that in the in the actual guidance document, which we can you know look at in, in due course, um, the um, we we talk about the relatedness of the research to the underlying business associate activity, the legitimate business associate activity. I mean, I don't know. You know, look, the here's the problem. I mean, is it a definitional problem? Yes. The problem is, is that the alternative is to say, which we could say, I mean, you guys could recommend, is that BAA should not be eligible, you know, to, to, to take advantage of this exemption, which would send them back. It's not that they can't do the research. They would just have to go back and they would have to have a full IRB protocol, waiver of consent, waiver of authorization. So that's not what I'm proposing. I mean, okay. I think this makes all the sense in the world. Yeah. But, but the question is the scope of that coverage. Right. Um, so we don't want to say, and because I don't think it was intended, that they be excluded in their HIPAA covered activities. Um, but we also don't want to say that once you've established a legitimate BA, that you can do anything you want with that company. That's right. And so I think where people will be looking for guidance and where I'm still, frankly, unclear is where you draw that line. Right. Um, and I don't know how to get it. You know, I'm almost attempt, I'm, I'm tempted almost to take that first possibility, which is just limited to the data you're already exchanging. Uh -huh. That's so possible. For yeah. clarity. Yeah. Because I don't know otherwise how to define it. And after all, these are, this is an exemption. I mean, it doesn't have to be, this is research that can already be done. It just needs to be reviewed by an IRB. That's right. Um, so I don't know. I think we need to, there's some danger in not having a clear recommendation, rightly or wrongly. Or, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. So the theory, right, is that we think it's appropriate for the exemption to apply whenever there's a business associate agreement that's subject to enforcement by OCR, right? right. That's right. So maybe that's the way to, to clarify it, um, although maybe that's what the, where the confusion is. Like, what, what are those scenarios in which the, the business associate would be um, subject to enforcement by OCR directly, and where would they not be? So the areas where they wouldn't be subject to OCR enforcement, we want to take out of this. HIPAA exemption. 
right? Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> Um, actually, everything about this, the business associate issue here is extremely complicated, as I think everyone is recognizing. Um, and I think it's, you know, certainly would be valuable to have some examples, and I wouldn't be able to um, endorse uh, without further study and work with our uh, general counsel. Um, but I think, you know, what I said before at the subcommittee stage, too, is that, you know, it's, it's helpful for us to have a lot of smart, thoughtful people um, suggest how we should interpret things. Um, and so that's, that's how we take it when a recommendation comes in. And we, we think about whether it makes legal sense, um, whether it's possible to do. So, so I can't say right now for sure that this, you know, the scope of the coverage of the business associate and its activities, um, and and how um, or to what extent that would constitute a use that would fall under this. Um, but but um, I would I would be happy to get uh, recommendations about this. Stephen, let me say one uh, just a riff on this. Um, the um, one of the complications here, and one of the reasons not to have just a bright line test of the data that you ship over for the BAA purposes, it, those are the only data that can be used for the exemption, is the following. And that is that it actually relates to the sixth point in, in, in all of this, which is the, the, um, the distinction between the difference in the interpretation of research between OCR and, and um, OHRP. Because remember that OCR has a primary purpose test for an activity. And that is that under, for OCR's purposes, something can be research and operations, research and public health surveillance all at the same time. And so to understand, like, you know, what it is, one looks at the kind of primary purpose of it. Under, um, for OHRP, if it's, re it's either research or not, and it's nothing else. It's either research and jurisdiction attaches or not. So when you think about what this is, I mean, the reason to, to try to extend the exemption a little bit, although I don't know what the right answer is here, is that what the business associate is doing for this kind of additional purpose, it may be research to OHRP, but it may be, op it may be pure operation still or public health activities in OCR's view. And so the question would be, do we want to penalize them <laughs> you know, by not giving them access to the exemption when they're actually doing something that is, um, that is, that is also, that is operations under, under uh, the HIPAA interpretation. So, but then those examples would clearly be under the business, existing business associate agreement. They would, yeah. I mean, I, I guess I'm struggling with giving a recommendation. I mean, maybe part of this is that o we have to work with OCR to, to work out actually the details of because yeah. it seems to me like we're struggling. It's not clear to me whether this is regulatory complexity that we just need the time to parse out or whether actually these are things we don't know. I'm, I'm beginning to feel like it may be the latter, and, and then we should, but, you know, again, it's an exemption, so people are going to start using it, and I think we need to, I, I, I get all the reasons for wanting it to be broader, and I'm not arguing against that, but I think we need to, articulate, give warning right. that um, these things are okay, clearly under the exemption. Then there's this area which hasn't been established yet, and either you can talk to OCR and see if this is your particular case is un would be covered under HIPAA, in which case you get the exemption, um, or wait for further guidance. I mean, I'm not sure. So I think it's hard for us to parse this, certainly hard for me to parse it. You're much better at it, obviously. But um, as a research organization dealing with covered entities and their contracting departments, okay, so you're just this person sitting in the contracting office of a covered entity, and basically you do not want to take any risks. So you don't want to deal with anyone that you can't deal with under a business associate agreement. So it becomes very difficult to conduct research, even if the two organizations involved actually want to do so and can do so in very productive and, and protective ways. 
it becomes actually difficult to engage in research jointly because there is an assumption in the business office that we don't deal with people and, and transfer PHI unless we can do it under a BAA because otherwise we don't feel safe doing it. So this kind of opens the thin edge of the wedge even further by saying, okay, so we can only engage in research with organizations for whom we already have a legitimate BAA. We really aren't going to engage in this with anyone for whom we can't do legitimate BAA. And once we have that BAA, we're going to extend it as far as possible because that makes life a lot easier in the contracts office. And so it, it does trouble me in the sense that it's almost a kind of, almost a competitive problem for organizations that wouldn't normally wish to have a BAA or be covered under a BAA, but wish to do research with a protected uh, a, a HIPAA um, covered entity. So just think about that, that simple-minded problem, so, not a subtle problem. So Sandy, can I just, I, you know, the other thing about this is that it's an exemption. It's not enabling regulation. So anything you couldn't do now, you can't do under the exemption. So all of the scenarios that you, so this wouldn't enable anyone de novo to go out and get a business associate agreement and do research. It only says if you have a legitimate business associate agreement and relationship and data exchange process, you may not have to go to the IRB. Yeah, but that's but, big. No, no, I understood. But, but it's not telling you you can do new things. It's only telling you that some of the things you were doing already, you may be able to do more easily. Well, but more easily is huge. And, and, and um, I mean, so, I mean, I, just this week, we've been dealing with a covered entity who wants to engage in research with us and who is basically insisting that we sign a business associate agreement. And we're scratching our heads saying, gee, first of all, we don't really want to sign a business associate agreement for exactly the reasons that you've mentioned. And secondly, we're not sure it's appropriate in this situation, but that's what their contracting office is insisting on. So it may be that we either do that or we don't actually engage in cooperative research. So, so, so I don't think, though, so you could do that. Like yeah, well, you could do that now. I mean, since these aren't in effect anyway. Right. You could do that now, and the institution would have to put it through their IRB, and those, res they could, I mean, I think it's probably yeah. best practice. Well, yeah. but it's best practice, if you call it a business associate agreement or not, it's best practice to contractually bind your subcontractors or contractors into your data protection. That doesn't make them a business associate by a HIPAA, and that's what you're really talking about. I mean, if you did it today, yeah. that's what it would be, and, and it would and still need IRB. I, I would argue that I think that that's very context and location specific. I think that there are certainly around the country areas where there's been wonderful growth and intermingling of university and covered entities where there's routine cooperation. Uh, and so I think it really depends on where you are to say that people are going to be reluctant to engage in research. I know our facility does reach out to all the other universities, and it, it's been a, a very rich experience. I would say dealing with counties is a totally different experience. So I just, I mean, I think everything that I'm hearing seems correct, but the sort of subtext seems wrong, so that there's nothing that this, it, it's, there's nothing that this exemption makes harder. It only makes things easier. So there's nothing under our interpretation or anything else that will change the rules so that it's harder to do research or there's something you want to do now that you won't want to do under the exemption. So I think, Sandy, everything you raise about the barriers and maybe making it easier will make new things attractive um, to doing. But I, I think that needs to be the perspective. There's nothing in the exemption that makes anything more difficult. And all the complexities were there to begin with. Um, so maybe having that option will open the idea of research to people who didn't want to take on the complexities of IRB review. But that's a positive thing. It doesn't take anything away to have the exam. I'm talking about, I mean, to be blunt about it, a competitive disadvantage. 
that the notion that if you are a B, have a BAA and have enacted a BAA, you can also do research, but if you don't, you can't, is from a business perspective a competitive disadvantage. That's what I'm saying, and I'm just wondering whether that's appropriate. I agree with you completely. You're not making anything more difficult, but you're making something relatively more difficult. No, it's just a fascinating perspective. Yeah, Thank it's you. just yeah, different. It never occurred to me. So, I mean, let me give you the two alternatives, basically. You know, I don't know, you know, because in terms of this, I mean, if you think that if the, if the committee thinks, I mean, I'll change this anyway you want me to change it. I don't have a dog in the fight, right? So, the, so you just tell me what you want. The, um, but there, as I see it, there are two alternatives here. One alternative is to say that when there is a legitimate BAA relationship, the data that are exchanged for the purpose of the BAA relationship can be subject to, can take advantage of the HIPAA exemption. The other alternative is more expansive, which says if there is a legitimate BAA activity, one can exchange any of the data as long as the, the research activity is connected and reasonably related to the underlying BAA activity, and then they can still take advantage of the, the two entities can still take advantage of the HIPAA exemption. I'm happy to write either one. You know? so Mark, could we articulate the second to say that the additional data exchange could also be interpreted as falling under the HIPAA uh, categories? Make that explicit. There, there just needs to be some kind of test, I think, other than relatedness for the data you're exchanging. Anyway, think about it. I don't, okay. I don't know what the answer is either. Okay. I, okay. Maybe, anyway, I mean, you, you know, if you guys have bright ideas during the day, you know, let me know because I'm so happy to write it any way you want. So I hope this is okay with you, but in the interests of um, bright ideas, I think we should take a 15-minute break. Break. <laughs> get more coffee and come back at 10 of 11. Okay, sounds um, good. And we're going to start on time because, as you can see, this is a complicated and <laughs> we only have so much time. Thank you. Let's reconvene. Mark? Okay. So just to conclude the, the, uh, the point two discussion, I had some, uh, some sidebars with many of you, um, actually about 10 people um, in the, in the uh, interim. Um, the, uh, why don't I suggest this in terms of, because we'd like to get this, I mean, assuming that you guys think it's ready, we'd like to get it passed um, you know, tomorrow. Um, but what I could do with this is the following, if this meets with people's approval. I could basically limit this recommendation to say the data that you, PHI that you've shared for business for a legitimate business associate purpose could be the subject of research. We, and we know that's the case. In terms of whether, a, then point out, the second thing is to point out the, the um, that healthcare operations and other um, activities under the, under the OCR definition are broader than the research activities so that one can share these kinds of things for the uh, data for business operations, broadly speaking. And then the third thing is to say that whether, the, uh, whether an activity that is, uh, that is business operations uh, might fall or not under this exemption would really be a question for individual and covered entities to make a decision on their own as to whether the exemption applies or not. I mean, I'll write it more elegantly than that, but that's the basic idea. Comments? No, I, I think that that's good, with maybe making explicit that the test is whether it falls under OCR's jurisdiction. For yeah, okay, okay. Okay, now I think this is a somewhat easier, I mean, it's actually, a, this is a very um, difficult issue. The, um, let me tell you, let me show you, show you, oh, shoot. Let me show you why this is, um, is somewhat difficult. Luckily, I carry a handkerchief like some guy from the 1950s. <laughs> yeah. the, um, let me show you why this is an issue. Let me go back to the definition. Okay. This is the, 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 uh, the sort of stem phrase here. Secondary research for which consent is not required. Secondary research uses of identifiable private information or identifiable biospecimens if at least one of the following criteria is met. So it says identifiable private information or identifiable biospecimens if one of the following criteria is met. And then you look at three 
And it says the research involves only information collection and analysis involving investigators' use of identifiable health information, et cetera. The, the debate, for what it's worth, was whether uh, the, the use of the phrase identifiable biospecimens in the, in the STEM would mean that uh, the use of identifiable biospecimens, if it fit within three as well, would also be potentially exempt under this uh, so-called HIPAA exemption. There's also a somewhat misleading phrase in the, uh, in the preamble, in the, in the commentary, which indicated that this three, the subsection three, actually was available or is available for the, the, um, the use of, um, of identifiable biospecimens, which we realized later in talking with OCR, with um, OHRP, was actually unintentional. It, even though it says that, it was not meant to be that. So then the question becomes, um, let me just get through back to where we started. So then the question becomes uh, whether, whether we should actually, given this ambiguity, uh, although the other argument is that number three itself only talks about information. It doesn't talk about biospecimens as well. So are identifiable biospecimens able to be used for secondary research under this exemption or not? That's the question. And um, the recommendation after a lot of discussion by the subcommittee is that <clears throat> for a variety of legal policy and pragmatic reasons, we think the HIPAA exemption should not be read to be available for research involving identifiable biospecimens. It should only be limited, it should be limited to the, the use of the, of the identifiable data but not involve use of identifiable biospecimens. And just so you know why we made this recommendation, um, applying the exemption only to the, informa the identifiable information is the most consistent if you, if, with, with, the re with the actual literal reading of, of Romanet 3, which only talks about by, about information, even though the pre preceding phrase talks about information or biospecimens. So that's one reason. The second reason is that if we read the, given all that's gone on, the whole debate about, um, about whether uh, unidentified biospecimens should be regarded as human subjects or not in the NPRM, uh, all of these things, um, the, the uh, various cases that, we have, um, that we've talked about, for example, the Havasupai case in, uh, in, this, in these meetings, we think reading the HIPAA exemption to permit the exemption of identifiable biospecimens from informed consent would subvert the greater protections that were offered and certainly talked about in the commentary and in the final rule. So we think that, that not reading the exemption to extend to, to identifiable biospecimens would be uh, more protective of the autonomy and dignity interests, essentially, of, um, of individuals from whom the identifiable biospecimens have been taken. So it's not that you can't use them but you would have to go to an IRB with the full application for a waiver of consent and authorization. And the third thing is this. We asked ourselves, why would anyone want to take advantage of, if we applied, if we recommended that this exemption apply to the use of identifiable biospecimens, what are scientists going to use this for? Well, in most cases, on a mass scale, they'd want to use these identifiable biospecimens to do genetic sequencing. That's what they'd want to do which then takes you back into our point seven for today in regard to other laws, because if they did that, then they would run up against 25 different state laws which say that, that which have informed consent requirements or IRB approval requirements to do genetic testing on residents, on, on DNA extracted from residents of those states. So, you wouldn't, you'd still be back, even if you could take advantage of the HIPAA exemption for identifiable biospecimens, if you want to do genetic sequencing and that kind of research, or even exome sequencing, you would be back into the pickle because you have to obey state laws of needing either consent or IRB approval. So we don't think at the end it makes that much difference. And, and frankly, the states where the 25, uh, the 20, 20 or 25 states in which they have these genetic testing informed consent laws and disclosure laws, those tend to be the states in which most of the genetic uh, research is being done. So, the, um, so practically speaking, it doesn't make a lot of sense to, uh, it's not as though it's going to help many people to extend this to cover identifiable biospecimens. So those are the three reasons that we, uh, that we recommend this. So we believe that reading the HIPAA exemption to include identifiable biospecimens would be inconsistent with plain language as well as policy aims, and we recommend that, for, that formal clarification be published in that uh, in that spirit. Thank you. Comments? Gary. Yeah, 
uh, just sort of echoing what you said, Mark, as you know, uh, on OHRP's end, our understanding, and, and we can get into why we had both terms in the lead in because some of the what sub Romanets or whatever it is right. involve both, whereas some involve just one or the other. So that was just the wording, and as you noted, this particular Romanet, this particular subsection was relatively clear in terms of right. not mentioning the biospecimen thing. But yep. in any event, our understanding of, of what was intended, what we were trying to do, was in fact that we were not planning on, on biospecimens to be covered by this provision. And that was also consistent, I think, as a policy matter in terms of our understanding of how HIPAA worked, that it wouldn't have been under HIPAA in terms of the biospecimen itself. So right. for all those reasons, yep. just in case people care, the where the policy was coming from when it was originally drafted is consistent with the outcome you're reaching. Great, thank you. So let's move on. Okay. So issue four is the use of information about specimens that are added to the database or repository after the secondary research project issue begins. Actually, this should just be information added to the base, not, not biospecimens. That's an artifact of something previous. So can the HIPAA exemption be used to apply to information collected after the secondary research project for which the HIPAA exemption was sought and gained has begun? And so I have a handy graphic here. So if we have a, a, a Mercy uh, Hospital database, um, and, and these are just points in time, the investigator begins records research involving Mercy PHI using the HIPAA exemption, which means he or she has also gotten a waiver of authorization from the Privacy Board or the IRB at, at uh, Mercy or elsewhere that Mercy is respecting. And, they, and so they start doing the research at this time using the data from the Mercy PHI database. And then PHI is added to Mercy's PHI database after records research began, which really means that PHI database is not a term of art. I just mean the, the entire electronic medical record system of Mercy Hospital or Mercy Medical Center. Um, then can this exemption include this stuff as well, the stuff in this gap period here? And then going forward, can the database be, um, be supplemented going forward under the HIPAA exemption? So our recommendation is that the data collected by databases that are subject to the HIPAA privacy rule that continuously collect identifiable private information should be eligible for the HIPAA exemption including the data collected only after a secondary research project for which the HIPAA exemption is sought has begun. So after, in other words, that point in time. Um, the, uh, the types of secondary research, if you look at the second bullet point, for which investigators will likely seek to make use of the HIPAA exemption will include long-term medical records or social services review studies in which investigators would seek to use PHI that does not yet exist, but that would be anticipated to be added to medical or client records at some point in the future, even while the secondary research is ongoing. The preamble, that is the commentary to the adoption of this, confirms this understanding, noting that unlike the, this is a quote from the commentary, unlike the pre-2018 rules exemption, the final rule has no requirement that the information must be, the information must be pre-existing at the time that the investigator begins a particular research study. Um, and remember, though, that this recommendations limit is, is not including prospective interventions or prospective collections of data that would vary from the collections that would occur anyway under other authority, like in treatment, for example. Okay. So questions or concerns? I, I mean, I think that's entirely consistent with it's protected by HIPAA, so that's the protection that's sufficient and it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Okay. Um, this point we've actually been over already, and that is that, you know, we, we felt that it was, it was incumbent on us, at, on, on SACERP, on the subcommittee to, to advise SACERP, and then we recommend that SACERP advise the, um, the public and the secretary in particular um, as to why there is this presence of healthcare operations and uh, public health activities in, referenced in this exemption when the definitions of research are word for word the same, so why wouldn't, why is there this broadened definition? And the reason is, uh, as, I, as I said before, and this is based on our conversations with Marissa and with, and with others at OCR and others, and that is that um, an activity is considered research under the common rule, um, but not under HIPAA when the primary activity, the primary purpose of the activity under HIPAA is operations or public health activities and research is a subsidiary purpose. 
So there's the single test under the binary test for under the common rule. There is the primary purpose test under, under HIPAA. And so that is really why, that explains why it was necessary for the drafters of the final, of the final rule to include this reference to operations and surveillance activities. And there are a lot of activities, even aside from that, that are operations, for example, the collection of real-world evidence that's almost indistinguishable from uh, research anyway. So it's, um, so this is why. And our purpose in adding this in, and you can see there's a longer description in the, in the text of the, uh, of the proposed guidance, is really just to explain to the, to the public, that is the, the public that, that reads this stuff, uh, as to why this, uh, the limited group of the public that is, is as concerned about this as we are in this room, uh, the, uh, to explain to them why there is that, uh, that those additional, why those additional phrases are in the, in the regulation. Concerns or questions? Is there guidance for how you implement the primary purpose test? We haven't said specifically, like, if it's 51 percent or if it's, um, I think that we, the guidance that we've done on this topic has been about what you do when the primary purpose changes and how you need to start treating it differently if mm -hmm. your primary purpose changes. But we haven't given specific guidance on how you determine what the primary purpose is at the outset. So. I don't know how to write the guidance. I will say that in another context, there's discussion of, which is not explicitly to determine primary purpose, but there is relevant, I think, discussion about who the expected users are for what purpose. And so there's discussion about the expectation that the primary purpose is for the people who are responsible for managing, supervising, or making key decisions about a particular area of activity um, or regulating that activity. Um, and that sort of points toward this is a primary purpose versus a primary purpose of producing generalizable knowledge. It doesn't say that you can't publish this. Publication does not determine purpose, it's, but it's pointing toward the users of the activity and the uses of the information. So I, I just think that this primary purpose thing I know is something I'm going to be wrestling with. And I'm looking for some guidance on how to do this right, or at least defensively right. <laughs> it's on my list. Okay. <clears throat> for number six. This is the issue of using this exemption in combination with other exemptions that are available under the common rule for the use of identifiable data. So I have a, a handy example here, which is <laughs> Mercy Hospital with an investigator in PHI. Obviously, they can use, they can take advantage of the HIPAA exemption within, within Mercy Hospital. And then we have the Census Bureau over here and, this, and the publicly available data. So before initiating uh, the research, the investigator is going to take advantage of the HIPAA exemption, and he or she is also going to seek a waiver of HIPAA authorization from the Privacy Board or IRB because, as we've said before, the uh, HIPAA jurisdiction is, applies, and you've got to have a legal basis under HIPAA to use the information internally within Mercy Hospital. So that's consistent with everything that we've said before. Now, the question is, can the investigator use the Census Bureau's individually identifiable information as part of the research project involving PHI if use of the PHI relies on the HIPAA exemption? So can, they, can he or she bring this information inside the covered entity? Can they use in research without IRB approval? We regard this as being permitted so that one can use, one can merge data that are uh, that, that are exempt, the use of which for research is exempt under a number of exemptions. One can merge the data to do a research project. That's the recommendation. And have that project still be exempt. And the project itself could, and, and, the, and the piece of the project that is, actually the entire project would be exempt, and the piece of the project that would be under the HIPAA exemption would continue to be exempt. 
Does that does this make sense? Yes, because the whole project would be exempt because all the data going into it have a separate basis for an exemption. So this is not saying that anyone can use data that otherwise would not be eligible for an exemption. That's not the recommendation. It's only data that would otherwise, each independently, would be eligible for an exemption. You could merge them to use in one research project, which itself would be exempt. So the logical extension of this is it's beyond this particular exemption. It's interpreting exemptions as being able to apply. If you can cover a project through multiple exemptions, it remains exempt. It doesn't all have to fit under one. Exactly. 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 Yeah, it is. It is a somewhat weird example. I mean, one can use other. Uh, there are other exemptions. I mean. Um, so here's the recommendation. The HIP exemption should be made available for use in combination with other common rule exemptions that can collectively exempt a research project from common rule requirements. If an investigator is preparing a research study in which one set of data is eligible for the exemption and the remaining data are eligible for a separate exemption under the common rule, the study should be able to proceed on a common rule exempt basis because all of the data independently meet at least one of the exemption criteria. An example that we give here is a study that uh, is a research project using PHI from the medical records of a covered entity and also using government records containing some additional identifiable private information that would be open to the public upon request. So that's the recommendation. Okay. And now I'm going to move on to the last point, which is the uh, consideration of other legal requirements. So here we have, <clears throat> I think uh, this will be obvious based on everything that we've talked about before. Here we have Mercy Hospital, an investigator. We have a waiver permitting use of the PHI <clears throat> under, the, under the common rule. So this investigator under this, uh, under this example has, is, is doing research using PHI within the, his or her covered entity, Mercy Hospital. They have the, the PHI, therefore, qualify for the use of the PHI, qualify for the HIPAA exemption. There is a waiver of authorization in place for use of the same data granted by the IRB or the Privacy Board. So all of the bells and whistles, the criteria, the requirements for use of the HIPAA exemption have been satisfied. That's the, this is, that's the, that's the, um, that's the hypothetical. But the PHI here are less pristine than one may like because they contain a lot of different kinds of data that are buried within the PHI. This, by the way, I have to say, what, what I'm about to show here, I'm showing in the, you know, for the purpose of this understanding this HIPAA exemption, and the, but this is a problem that we have in research all the time, which is that investigators, they want a waiver of authorization or they want an author or they get an authorization and they fail in the authorization to list HIV infection, sexually transmitted diseases, genetic information, um, mental health or mental hygiene diagnosis, diagnosis information, they fail to list that. And so when a hospital hands over those data without the specific references in the consent slash authorization form, that is a problem. It's a legal, it's a general legal problem depending on the state laws that apply. Stephen, did you want to say something? I wanted to ask, and maybe we can save the answer to the end, but this is explicitly for secondary use, not for the collection of the data. Exactly. So uh, I'm just anticipating the examples you're going to give. I just think about when of those would apply additionally in the secondary use when they haven't already been discharged in the primary use. Yeah. Well, primary collection. okay, let me, let me go through and then we'll come back to that question, okay? So here are, the, here are some categories. So this investigator thinks that he or she is scot-free because they've got the fabulous HIPAA exemption and they've got the waiver of authorization from the IRB or Privacy Board. They're set to go. They then dig into the data here. And what they find in the data is they find HIV AIDS information, they find genetic information, they find mental health information, they find developmental disabilities information, they find tuberculosis information. Each of these is protected by different laws in different states. Most states, a majority of the states, have confidentiality laws that pertain to each of these. In some states, they'll have four out of five. Every state has an HIV law. Every state that I know of has a mental health law. 
20 or 25 states have laws regarding genetic information. Now, all we're saying in this recommendation is that the, we're not saying the investigator can't do the research and can't take advantage of the exemption. We're just saying when you do the research, you need to, to take account of all of the other kinds of laws that might apply even to your internal uses of these identifiable data for research purposes. And by the way, I should have added here the federal, the other federal law, which is primary, which is the uh, confidentiality of substance abuse and alcoholism treatment records and diagnoses. So the only thing this recommendation is saying, it's not saying you can't do the research. It's just saying that the HIPAA exemption does not exempt research from other sets of federal or state laws or regulations that might apply to the, even to the internal uses of the data. And we're just advising that the investigator, before he or she takes advantage of the exemption and or their institution, which is charged ultimately with the responsibility for obeying these laws in regard to the, their, their uh, use uh, internal uses of medical records would need to take account of that. You'd actually need to take even more account of it in collaborative research in which there's a waiver of, of authorization to disclose the information because many of the state laws are tied to disclosure rather than use and they would certainly apply to the um, to disclosure of, um, even if you have a waiver of authorization to disclose, there still may be a state bar to that based on these other laws and the federal bar of course with the with the confidentiality of substance abuse and alcoholism treatment. So that is the recommendation. It's just highlighting the fact that, that one, the HIPAA exemption gets you out of the common rule, but it doesn't get you out of all of these other state and federal laws. And Mark, I take back my question because I was thinking about record, reporting requirements, not, dis, not uh, confidentiality, obviously. Okay. Those are the, so that's the recommendation. Those are the recommendations. The, there's a, there is a longer document um, <laughs> which talks about each of these in detail. I don't think that, I, I, I should say not I don't think, I think that all I said today is consistent with the content of the, of the, uh, of the written document. What I would suggest is that um, on the second point, which we discussed in regard to the, um, the, uh, the business associate, I'll go back tonight and, and, and track changes. We'll try to change some language in that recommendation. You're not, we're not asking you to approve the PowerPoint. We're talking about the, what, what we're offering for approval will ultimately be tomorrow, I think, the, the text of the, um, of, the, of the recommendation. So I will go back and in track changes, try to make changes that reflect today's discussion in regard to the HIPAA exemption. So thank you, Mark. And I think that should be our goal, and I would encourage everybody to take a look at that tonight with the understanding that that section, question two, is going to be revised, but the rest of it we should be prepared to discuss tomorrow. Um, given that's where we stand, and given that the seven points, I think, were points discovered or raised by the subcommittee, not explicitly asked of us, I will give the community one last chance to ask if there's something that the subcommittee missed that we feel should be an important consideration. Um, going, going, okay. So good, so we'll, we'll come back tomorrow. Oh, Diana. Sure. Mark, on these informed consent documents that are um, academic industry collaborations, where I'm now more frequently seeing that um, your information is going to an, to a, a company that's not covered by HIPAA, and therefore no assurances can be made that your privacy will be protected. Right. So wh where does that fall in, in this discussion? Well, that's really a um, that's really a that's a, that's an important HIPAA question, but it's not really it doesn't really intersect with this because the HIPAA exem exemption is only available to entities that are using their own identifiable information or other identifiable information held by other covered entities. And pharma companies in general, unless they have some kind of case management function, which would make a piece of them perhaps a covered entity, and they would become a hybrid entity, but except for that rare exception, pharma companies, biotech, device, uh, are not covered entities. I understand that, but they team with covered entities. They, they, they do, and so, but this exemption would not allow the disclosure of PHI outside of the HIPAA covered entities for these research purposes. So it would not allow, so you could not as a pharma company come in and expect that you'd be able under this exemption 
to get information, to get identifiable information that would be used for research. So I think, you know, another way to articulate that, because the exemption, it's not really so much what the exemption allows you to do, it's that that research, while you can do it, wouldn't fall under the exemption. You wouldn't be able to exempt it. You'd have to get either authorization or, and you'd either have to get waiver of consent and authorization with a full IRB protocol, or you get consent and authorization with a full IRB protocol. Yeah. So this would not facilitate that category of research. Okay. Great. Thank you, Mark. Yeah. So, thank you, Michelle. <laughs> so we're actually early. But I, I'm, I'm very, very early, but I'm sensitive to, we, you know, these issues, it's very hard to predict how complex these issues are going to be or what issues are going to come up, and I would like to keep moving, and it's a little bit early for lunch. Um, but, but only, Michelle, if you're ready. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so the next topic is context in single IRB review. Michelle Russell Einhorn. Switching subcommittee. Good morning, thanks. So I do not have animated graphics like Mark Barnes. He's a really hard act to follow, so I think you all, I'll ask you to have a little sympathy for me. Um, <laughs> but I, I have to say, I, I do want to just thank Mark. Um, he's done just a spectacular job on parsing through these issues. So what is this? We were um, asked, just to recap, uh, to think about possible exceptions to requirements for single IRB review for multi-site research. Uh, we talked about it at a previous meeting. The previous meeting actually focused um, in part on the exceptions that we had included in the SACARP comments to the Notice of Proposed Rulemaking. Um, I took uh, the comments that came from this group, and we had a, a meeting of the subcommittees to discuss it um, in further detail. We also had a presentation from VA to um, provide us with some information on VA's experience uh, with uh, single IRB review and multi-site research. And so this is um, a written document because what, what we went over the last time I was here at the podium on this topic was a PowerPoint. Uh, so this is, um, uh, again, recommendations for exceptions to requirements for single IRB review of research. And Stephen, unless you have any objection, I'm going to do my usual let me give you an overview of the document, um, and then we can go back to the beginning. Okay, Julia? Well, actually, it should be in smaller font, but I don't know how to do this. <laughs> so if anybody wants to come up here and show me how to fix it, I'm willing to accept the assistance. <laughs> okay. I flunked technology. Uh -huh. there oh, see, oh, hey, hey, thank smaller. you. But wait, can you make it just slightly larger? There you go. <laughs> Perfect. Okay. All right. So uh, if you'll bear with me, what I'd like to do is give you a general snapshot, a general overview, I should say, of this document, um, and then we'll go back and parse through it. So the introduction basically discusses um, the recent initiative, so it summarizes very briefly that NIH issued a policy and that the um, NPRM included a provision requiring single IRB review for multi-site research, and that's included in the final revised rule. Um, the second section is it restates what the exceptions are today in the NIH policy. There's an exception. Uh, that talks about where the proposed SIRB is prohibited by federal tribal state law or where there's a compelling justification for the exception. The provision in the final rule states cooperative research where single IRB review is required by law 
So it's sort of similar to that first part of the NIH policies, although worded slightly differently. But instead of talking about a compelling justification, it talks about the federal department or agency determining that the use of single IRB review is not appropriate for the particular context. And so that's where there was a change in wording from the word study in the NPRM to the word context in the final rule. Um, OHRP requested that we consider the criteria that departments and agencies might consider when determining that single IRB review is not appropriate for particular context. So uh, here is the discussion part. So it uh, repeats that previously SACARP discussed possible exceptions for single IRB review in multi-site research in the comments to the Notice of Proposed Rulemaking. We'll go over that in a little more detail. Um, that we, uh, uh, well, actually, let me go back to this one. So ultimately, this was from the comments. Ultimately, um, the first, uh, two of the bullets were um, incorporated. So uh, where um, uh, local IRB review is required by federal trial, uh, federal uh, state laws, um, and um, where it's not appropriate. Um, and uh, and then, let's see, sorry, having eyeglass trouble here, need to take them off. Um, so where, where local IRB review is required by federal, state, or, tri or other regulations, um, where the funding agency determines it's not appropriate, um, we note that if research is not federally funded, it would not be subject to the requirements, and after re-review, that there's no reason to exempt research that does not meet the definition of clinical trial. So that actually came from a conversation at the last meeting where it seemed like we didn't seem to come up with a reason why that should make a difference. With respect to the exception in terms of a number of sites, we had input from the VA that was very useful, and there was a sense that if it was under five sites that um, you could have a, sh a, a shorter time frame, and if it was uh, over five sites um, that you had longer time frames, and so it was worth having the single IRB review for multi-site trials. Um, so this is where we get into the difference between the word study and the word context. And here uh, we wrote that SACARP has considered the change from the word study to context. The word study means an investigation or analysis of a subject or situation, while the word context means the circumstances that form the setting for an event statement or idea in terms of which it can be fully understood and assessed. So ultimately, we brought this back to the subcommittees, and really based upon the conversation within the subcommittees, there were three exemptions that we felt deserve further discussion. One is where the research involves five or fewer sites, with the feeling being that that should be eligible for some exception to the requirement for single IRB review. Where review by a single IRB is unable to meet the needs of specific populations. So this ties into this issue of um, if you have vulnerable populations, does that make it per se inappropriate to have single IRB review in a multi-site research? And I think the consensus was no, just because there's vulnerable subjects doesn't mean that it's not a, a, you know, a possible scenario, but really we needed to be more specific about what types of situations involving um, vulnerable populations might be appropriate for an exception. And the second one was an issue that actually came up. Um, at the last subcommittee meeting, it was not discussed at the last time at SACARP, and that was where the research involves political, controversial, or sensitive issues such that review by local IRBs would better address these concerns. So um, this paragraph talks about the uh, five or fewer sites um, that there was this, that we, at least in the subcommittees, and again, this is a document the subcommittee bring here to SACARP so we can change the wording, whether inclusion of vulnerable populations constitutes a valid reason, and the consensus, at least in the subcommittees, is that single IRB review is not per se inappropriate, but that there were situations that we identified where an IRB, a single IRB might not be the best IRB to address the needs of specific populations. And there's three examples um, that we provide here, which we can go back over. Um, and then the third one that we're recommending is to accept research that has political, controversial, or sensitive overtones 
such that re re review by a local IRB would better address these concerns. So the example that we discussed was research involving medical marijuana. The thought was that this would better be reviewed by an IRB that has experience with this substance, as opposed to an IRB that does not have experience and would need to bring in an ad hoc consultant. So while you can bring in an ad hoc consultant, certainly that's permitted under the regulations, the thought was that if you really want to protect people in research and you really want to have the right expertise and you're dealing with it, an issue that is of some sensitivity, then that might well uh, be a situation where, um, where you should not have one IRB for multi-site research. And then a conclusion that SACARP does support the goals of single IRB review in improving efficiency and protecting research subjects, but submits their situations where um, the scenario might not be the most appropriate and recommends the three exceptions. So um, I'm here today to offer this document to the group for discussion. Um, so Stephen, do you have any immediate comments? Well, I do. <laughs> so the first is a framing question, a uh, framing point. So we were asked to identify the considerations that agencies should use in trying to decide whether single IRB is appropriate. And I think that's what we should stick to. That's the language and framing we should use throughout the document as, opposing, as opposed to recommending specific exceptions. So the language around the five IRB, the five site limit, um, I think we should just say that's something that should be taken into consideration, not that we feel that that should be an exception, because I think it's very study specific. Similarly, I think with the multiple, with the um, vulnerable population examples we give, there's obviously another point at which that can be addressed, which is in the choice of the single. Um, and we don't make that explicit, but to me, in many cases, it would be better to find an IRB that was qualified to do both pediatric and maternal review, rather than splitting it out because that's what the institutions did. Um, so I, I think all of our, all the points are great, and they're all things to consider, and I just, my main concern is that they be framed as points to consider, not as recommendations for exclusion, exceptions. Other comments? Karen. Hi, this is Karen from VA. I, um, first of all, thank you for the document. I think it's a, a again, these are hard to do and, and very difficult to uh, attack because that's what we're doing here. What I'm concerned about speaking from VA is, is that it appears that VA is making your, I mean, that it, you're, you're accepting VA's experiences as the recommendations for SACARP. Um, and so I'm worried from that, from a federal government perspective, because, you know, it's what about NIH, what about DOD, and what about what have been their experiences with multi-site review? So while we do in VA have an incredible amount of experience, our data is continually changing. So, so I, what I'm reading about this, looking at this in a highly political environment, is that, oh, well, then it's going to come back to VA, well, give us all your data on five. <laughs> or how did you come to five? We're continually changing, so I'm going to make a recommendation that we avoid naming, you know, a federal agency because that represents our experience. It, it may not be reflective of our other sister agencies. Thank you, and thank you for, for getting on the call and talking to us about this. It, it really was very, very helpful. Um, and I think, you know, had you chosen your analysis at a point different than five, it might have turned out to be a number different than five. So. I think that's a, a good caution. And I also think we can probably take out specific attribution to the VA. So I, I, we were somewhat sensitive to that as well. On the other hand, in presenting the topic, it seemed we needed some data to back it up. Well, then just, I'm going to ask, <laughs> why didn't you seek the others? <laughs> because it's not just VA. So, you, so we've got NIH here. And so, and so it's, it's like it's skewed. You're so, right. So it needs to be fair and balanced. So that's my concern when VA is being singled out in a guidance document for our experiences because we have the NIH, for example, that has a lot of experience with their different uh, central IRBs. And then we have other different agencies that use different types of multi-site IRBs in the federal government. So that's my concern with just singling out VA. I don't think that it's, it's 
something that VA would support and get. It's SACARP's guidance, but I don't think it's. I'm worried about some, some issues that are in the statements. Well, you make a good point, which is that it's just VA's experience and there's other federal government agencies that have exactly the same type of experience. So I, I agree. I, and we can work on reframing that. So let me ask, Valerie, <laughs> whether there are other, other federal government agencies present today who would be prepared or willing to share any experience they may have um, with single IRB review. Sorry. Um, I, I know that the NCI Central IRB CERB has a great deal of data and they do present on it fairly regularly, and, but I haven't asked anybody in particular. And I can go back and ask if you'd like. And some of that's been published. A great deal of it's been yeah. published, yes. My, rec uh, my recollection of the published stuff that I've seen is generally, you know, it's a sort of cost-benefit kind of thing, and, a, and, and it generally comes out generally in favor of the single IRB model. I don't think they break down, I don't think any of that literature addresses specific criteria in which it might or might not work. It's more an assessment of the entire thing. That, I, I believe that's correct, yes. So, Stephen, can I go back to your two comments? One is that um, your recommendation is to reframe it as points to consider as opposed to recommended exceptions. I mean, I personally think that's fine if that's the group's consensus. Um, the second one, though, was where you talked about the proposal, instead of talking about vulnerable populations but the needs of specific populations, that actually at the time that the choice of the single IRB is considered, that they should consider one that has expertise in both areas. Where are you going with that in terms of changing that point to consider? And well, I think so. It? The point to consider, I think, is valid. Obviously, that okay. is something you know. The, the needs of specific populations, and, and particularly populations that are separated by research site, um, might be a valid consideration. I just you know, and and I. I may, this may be my own, it, this is my own opinion, others may not agree. Obviously, the, I come from a single IRB world. So that's my background and, and I know there's a lot of flexibility for managing this kind of thing and I don't want to, I think, to make a strong recommendation with these examples kind of invites a lot of exceptions based on circumstances that from a subject protections point of view I think are better addressed by having an appropriate single IRB. So there is the downside always, it's not just time, of having multiple IRB reviews with multiple versions of the consent form and multiple changes requested of the protocol, which might go beyond this, just the whole idea of this is because there's almost sort of an arbitrary sense to those things. The ones that are specific to the populations are obviously appropriate and they want, you want to capture. So it just reading the examples, I think it makes sense on its face. Reading the examples, my reaction was, well, I think this is better addressed through the proper choice of an IRB. I, I'm not sure. I would love to hear how other people think about that because obviously I have a particular perspective that I'm speaking from. I, I had a similar reaction to them. Um, and in the course of the discussion, right? Uh, with, with the subcommittees. So my worry is that these are the sorts of things that if we recommended them as true exceptions as opposed to points to consider, then the exception will swallow the rule and that we will end up not really utilizing single IRBs as much as the common rule revisions are suggesting they ought to be used. Um, you know, because everything could really, depending on, depending on, you know, what the investigator thinks or what the site thinks, everybody could be described as a specific population, right? You know, you can really kind of um, split hairs about about that, and similarly, you know, what counts as a sensitive topic? I think Stephen's point is well taken. Yes, there are sensitive topics, but then you identify the single IRB that um, can address them. It doesn't necessarily mean that each local IRB needs to address those sensitive topics, especially because they <laughs> might um, reach conflicting conclusions that would uh, eliminate some of the efficiency considerations that were driving single IRB. But I, I second the, the goal of getting more data. I mean, any, 
any number that we want to put in here as points as a point to consider, whether it's you know four or ten sites or whatever it is, um, it's going to it's going to sound arbitrary unless we have some evidence behind it. And, and just to add, I mean, every IRB has to have appropriate expertise. Right. So, so I, I mean, some of this is how much is appropriate expertise, and you know, you can go to a certain level and it's just like really appropriate expertise, but it doesn't mean that yeah. something I mean, I'm slightly just, less than that is not not sufficient. Yeah. I mean, the example about the deep brain stimulator is kind of like, okay, well, capacity has already been determined. It's just the fact that two different um, research interventions are happening at two different sites doesn't seem to be sufficient to suggest that you need um, differential IRB review at each site. So do we actually need this guidance? <laughs> I mean, I mean, I, you know, I, I, I just, so first, it, it's moving from exceptions to points to consider. But, you know, at the NIH guidance says a compelling justification. So, you know, compelling is, that's a pretty broad phrase, and a lot can go under that. And the federal agency decides it's not appropriate, and, you know, in the revised final rule. And so, to me, what that says is that, um, you know, Boston Children's Hospital could submit a, a grant and, and they could say, we think that there needs to be, you know, a very specialized neonatal IRB and a very specialized pediatric IRB. So that would be within the context of the request, and then the government would decide whether it's appropriate or not. I, I guess we were, we were asked to consider this. We were asked about the difference between study and context. Um, I do think that context is a broader word than study, and that provides the permission, you can say, to sort of look, you know, at more information. But, but I, what I'm hearing is that we don't have enough information or data to be able to say whether there's a magic number, that, that calling out the needs of a specific population is really something that should go into the consideration of compelling justification or not appropriate. Um, and that political and sensitive, again, goes back to this issue of evaluating the appropriateness and the expertise of a specific IRB. I mean, we could still say these things, but I'm just throwing this out. Karen. Yeah, this is Karen again from VA. I, I, I think you've just touched upon what we were going to bring up here, is that this guidance is directed towards us as the funding agencies. And so it's just like you said, uh, when it comes to, you know, the, the the, the funding agency is going to determine that it's not inappropriate. You know, what's that context we're going to use? We're going to make that decision, you know, in, in consultation with, you know, our, whoever we're funding. But in terms of trying to write a general guidance for this, again, it's not to the general IRB world, it's to the funding agencies. So I think the audience is very limited in this. And so I think the question does come, is this really a good use of SACARP's time to make recommendations to us when maybe something, another topic should go for the general IRB community? I mean, I think it's a great discussion. I, you know, and, I, and I, I think what's really fascinating is how we kind of went from a lot of different, you know, possible exceptions, and then we narrowed it down, and when you really talk through them, you start to realize that maybe the, you don't need to, you know, phrase them as exceptions. But I'm just wondering if something, I mean, let's assume it came out and we cleaned it up, right? So what? So I think, actually, that it has value. I think that, again, the framing goes back to the request from OHRP. So there are two criteria. There are local law, basically, or other law. And then there are, you know, the funding agency, the department or agency feels it's not appropriate. And the request was specifically what, should, what are some of the considerations that the agency should take into account to determine it's not appropriate. So we weren't asked to add bullet in Romanets, you know, three, four, and five. We were asked in a general sense what sh they should take into consider consideration. And I think, you know, the size of the study, whether it be, you know, that there, that there may be, I think it's worth saying that there may be studies that where the site number is low enough that you really don't gain any efficiencies or protections by having um, single IRB review and that that should be taken into consideration. I don't think we have the data to make a recommendation about a, a number, although we could cite we could certainly suggest five. And I think, you know, the other points, I don't know whether they need stating. They're sort of the obvious things that these are, these are the reasons you might want more than one IRB, you know, is the, its local context. 
gets back to what we've been talking about on this topic for years. Um, and whether you capture that as needs of particular populations or skills of particular investigators, um, I mean, I think it, it might be worth articulating you know, those things, but, but it is the same discussion we've been having. And I'm not sure, so maybe I agree. I mean, it's an, interesting, it's an interesting conversation because if, in fact, this document is actually going to be used for the federal agencies, I mean, I kind of hadn't you know, thought about it in that way, you really want to have all the federal agencies that are funding multi-site research to really have input into this and to share, to share their current experiences. So, you know, we're actually looking at this from a, a much broader perspective and maybe the institutional priorities and concerns as opposed to the funding agencies. So let, so <laughs> let me just ask, and then I'll come back, Sandy, to, you, to, to Karen and Valerie. Do you have or foresee a pro do you have or foresee putting in place a process a formal process to evaluate whether a study should be exempt from the single IRB requirement and what kind of things have you considered um, having in that process if you're able to share that we've had a lot of discussion about the formal process that we will have in place um, of course this neither the common rule provision nor the NIH policy is going to take effect for either one year or several years. And so um, we haven't finalized it because it doesn't have the urgency of some other things that we're working on. And so, so we will have a formal process, but I can't really share anything at this time. For VA, we, we will have a formal process and put it in policy along with ensuing guidance. But, but for example, um, what we would say is like for two studies, many of our VAs, we do thousands of studies involving two where we already have existing relationships, existing MOUs for use of our academic affiliates. So um, to, to break that up and now, you know, have to have an, an argument who's going to use it, we already have that relationship. Um, and so we will, we will have policies based upon the existing relationships we have with our types of IRBs and also the type of study. Um, certain, especially if we're dealing like political issues, Schedule One drugs, service dogs, you know, things that are that are re relative to our organization. So we will include that in policy and guidance. So, other than participating in the discussions we've been having for years on this topic here, in one context or another, is our is is a SACARP guidance useful to your agencies? I think I think that we will consider the, the thoughts and considerations of anybody who wants to provide that information to us. I'm I'm not going to be setting up this process, so I don't know how much consideration it will give, but will we'll, we'll certainly be considered. And so it could be useful. It might bring up issues that the agency doesn't think of. Ours. We can't think of everything ourselves, so we do ask the public. If, of the learned committees that have this information to provide. And VA would concur. We, we recognize we do not have all the answers. And so to get input from the research community, and especially from this expert group at SACARP, over what are the things that we should be considering that is useful to us, because it's input from, from you as experts. So Sandy first. Both. Um, I'm Libby White from DOE. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I just want to say we currently have two central IRBs. Um, we would find any guidance you provide us um, to be very useful. We currently uh, require that DOE-funded studies or outside agency-funded studies that involve DOE employees, current or former employees, be reviewed by our central IRB. And then certain types of research, like all beryllium-related health effects research and all research on our all research falling under our former worker medical screening program, which is a huge program across the DOE complex, <clears throat> go to a central IRB. We also require that all intel-related research that our, that our sites do go to one of our central IRBs that focuses on that type of research. And um, any research involving more than one DOE laboratory. So for us, even two 
research at two D in the site would be required to build the two D site. But you know, just ideally both. And do you have an exception process? Um, we've sort of considered those on a case by case basis. So guidance from you would be very helpful on that. Thank you. <laughs> Good handy. So a lot of the work that I've done is on very vulnerable and sensitive populations. And so I'm, I'm wondering exactly how we would figure out if an IRB had the expertise. Because it's a, often it's a weird nexus of vulnerability, law, and practice, and a political motivation for an issue. And it would be, I think, sometimes very difficult for a central IRB to really be on top of that in a large number of sites on a very sensitive topic where it really can be very individual. Topics like abortion, um, topics like other kinds of vulnerable populations, because there, there, you may you may not worry about it unless you think there is actually a real political or or social motivation to really go after something that gives extra oomph to some of the vulnerabilities. So, I just want to keep that on the table. It, it, how, how do we know that a central IRB has the relevant expertise, um, and how do they do that when some of these issues really have a very local context? Them. And some of them are very real. By the way, I also think this will be very important. Having the SACARP guidance is important to investigators mm -hmm. who need to figure this out and, and sort of has a starting point, and also to IRBs who need to know when they want to, you know, really not oppose this at all and let it be, and when they really want to kind of join with their investigators, in a sense, to, to raise the issue. So I, I think having guidance will be helpful, generally, to the field. Thank you. Um, so Joanne Les was moving toward her mic, which reminded me that um, we had a meeting with some people from the C, uh, CDRH, and the device people were talking about how they didn't think that local IRB review was appropriate for device research. So I emailed Joanne about that and I never heard, I don't, I don't know if you got any more. <laughs> Did you get any information about their concerns? Well, let me start by saying that um, on behalf of FDA, we would support the other agencies here that have said this would be helpful. We don't yet have it in our codified, but you know, as we indicated in the proposed rule and in the final rule, that we intend to harmonize as much as we can. And so we're struggling with some of the same questions of when it's appropriate, when it's not appropriate. So um, I think this guidance would be great. And I would, you know, it'd be a shame, I think, if you guys decided to not go forward with it. As far as the device issue goes, I think it's similar to what you all have dis been discussing, that a lot of the device studies only have three or four sites. And so they're asking the same question, does it really make sense to go through all of the trouble of entering into the interagency, or the uh, written agreements that would be required as opposed to just going to those three sites, especially when you have device manufacturers that have been using the same sites over and over and they already had those established relationships. It's probably quicker for them to just go to a few sites rather than to go to a central IRB. But um, we did reach out to them and we talked to them about it and, and it was similar to what you all have been discussing. So, Joanne, it sounds like those concerns are efficiency concerns, not subject protection concerns. Is that fair? It's not what I was expecting. I was expecting some subject protection concerns and not that efficiency concerns are not obviously important. I think it's more efficiency. I mean, and there is also the local question, um, you know, with some of the device studies you have, devices that have been developed by a clinical investigator as opposed to a drug study. You're not going to have, you know, investigators develop a new drug necessarily where you do see that in the device world a lot and they feel comfortable with that institution where they're doing their research, that IRB knows them, knows their research. And so I think they, there is that aspect to it, but a lot of it is also the efficiency. So I haven't heard anybody um, disagree with the um, discussion about the move from study to context. And what I'm hearing is a change from um, 
recommendations for exceptions to points to consider, and that the three things that we've identified, the three general topics, well, there's always some comeback answer, well, you know, you might not need to do it that way, or you could always find an IRB with the right expertise, that ultimately all three pose situations where it might be appropriate to not have a single IRB. And maybe that's all we need to do to accomplish is not to, you know, we've kind of eliminated the ones where it really doesn't seem like there's a good justification to include it, but these three seem to be okay as points to consider. So I think that's good. I, I think, it, and I, I apologize if this is already in the document. Um, okay. I like you, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> but I would, you know, I think the concerns, again, we've been having this debate for a decade, really, about the role of single IRBs. And, and it's always come down to subject protection issues. And Jerry had an article in the New England Journal raising the point that there may actually be improved protections with single IRB. But it's usually been the driver is efficiency and the, the, the reaction is subject protection. And I think it's worth being explicit that some of the reasons to consider some of these issues in choosing whether to use a single IRB or not are in fact that a single IRB may not be more efficient in some of those cases. I mean, that's the reason for the small site numbers. That's the reason in the device study context. And given that that's the driver, I think it's ex it should be explicit that in the recommendation, the reason for not using a single IRB if you have three sites is that, in fact, it may take away from the efficiency of the review. Sure. I think for the other two, at least within the subcommittees, the concern is that if you have the needs of specific populations and if you have political and sensitive issues, however you define those, that actually going to IRBs with really strong expertise in particular areas or really strong familiarity with certain sensitive issues within a community, that that's, that's a subject protection issue as opposed to an efficiency issue. But we can, but, but I think the, I think what I'm hearing is that, you know, this is all going to depend on every study. And um, all this is is just raising these as general considerations. But with respect to the sites, we can actually add that, add more information about that. Is this an all or nothing thing? In other words, suppose you have 20 sites, and a couple of them are in places where there's real sensitivities about the particular topic. Does that mean that all 20 of them then have to opine about this? Or could it be, this, this could be, there could be some parsing here that maybe a couple of sites need to do reviews, but the rest of them could be under the IR, central IRB. So, I mean, do we want to raise the question of whether there's some subtlety that's possible here, that it's not all or nothing? I, I mean, from the world of independent IRBs, that's standard, that you, you can have a multi-site trial where, you know, 50 sites rely on one IRB and 50 sites have their local IRB. I think, though, since much of our audience will come from but, the institutional. But we could raise it. That we should make that explicit, that we're not saying it's all or nothing, that there could be situations where there are specialized concerns at a particular site or for particular right. issues that require us. And there's another, that IRB may not be otherwise administratively capable of doing a 50-site study, to be honest. So, right. and, and it shouldn't it shouldn't be an all or nothing. And I think that that should be explicit. I think that's a great point. NIH SAQs make that clear, that it, that we would expect most of the sites to use the single IRB, and there may be situations where an exception is needed for a particular site or population, and that, but that the rest of them would be expected to use a single um, IRB. I, I guess I would be concerned how we worded that, because it's not entirely our place to say that if it's going to be a requirement of a funding agency, perhaps, that we can recommend. And then I guess the question will come up, who can help with making that determination? So, you know, I think that's going to be difficult for the one institution out of 30 that says, well, I really want to want this reviewed at a local level, and the agency's going to say, 
the other 29 sites are all fine with the central IRB. And I also wonder what the motive is going to be to to say that at that one institution because I'm thinking that most of these large multi-institutional studies are less about highly sensitive context dependent research and more about standard biomedical research with chemotherapeutic agents or something of that sort. So is it an issue of trust? Is it an issue of cost? Is it something that we can't really put into the recommendation? So I think my uh, comment may respond to that a little bit. Um, I think as we're moving to points to consider and how to describe this, one of the things that I felt when I looked at uh, the examples um, was that it may not draw broadly enough. There's sort of the clear, almost said in the sense of some of the vulnerable populations, but not quite, where it might be helpful to expand to some populations like certain immigrant groups that may be, um, you know, where the local context may be important there and may, where, where a uh, local IRB and lo who has had that relationship knows what some of the concerns of that group may be as opposed to just adults, children, pregnant women, you know. Right. Um, so that, it, that if we broaden those examples, that that might help at least to explain what we think of as the context that may say that's where we, you know, a single IRB may be able to get the expertise on some of this or we may be wanting to look into the local. Um, and it struck me, and I, I will just note too, the, um, in the uh, description of the medical marijuana case, right, one I perhaps has experienced in that case, may not be the right phrasing. <laughs> I'm sorry, that really struck me as I read it. And I think actually there's another, not just a funny point to make, but in terms of that's really about context, right? Because a, a um, locality or a state that has gone through the political process to say, we think either medical marijuana or marijuana more generally is okay, is very different than a state that has not gone through that process. And therefore, how they are going to perceive it and what are the risks in that may be important. So it seems to me less about the experience like the neonates versus the pregnant women and more about what's the context. And I was very much struck, um, and this I think goes to Aviva's, Aviva's point, is uh, what came up in HIV, right? So we would see not necessarily um, in clinical trials, but in uh, prevention research and trying to understand in different populations, and they would be multi-state, multi-site um, prevention studies looking at, uh, you know, what risk factors in a variety of ways, but the context in which they were happening were very dependent on the nature of the epidemic and, uh, or the primary drivers of the epidemic in particular areas. So among uh, men who have sex with men in some co context, among um, uh, African American, maybe heterosexually dri driven in various others. A and I remember seeing IRB protocols, you know, with, with it was issues about language, right? And what you needed to have in the language in San Francisco when you're going into the clubs was really quite different than if you were in the Midwest and going into other contexts. And so that could be the example where you really need to know your population um, and where it may be appropriate. And again, sort of, again, expanding on those examples may help explain what is kind of a hard language of this political, controversial, sensitive issues mm -hmm where really sort of understanding something about how it plays out in your town may be important. I just, I, I want to just pick up on one of Leslie's points, which I think is really important. I would strongly suggest that the focus ought to be on the risks, on, on particular kinds of risks. I'm, as someone who does a lot of work in, in this stuff, I'm a little, I'm a little, um, wary of encouraging people to involve IRBs and the single IRB issue 
with issues of language, because I think that's a different kind of a problem. Um, but I think the risks are very central <coughs> to what the IRBs are supposed to be doing and what the local context might suggest. Um, so I just pick up that on that one point of yours where I think you've mentioned risks, and I think that's really critical. I would respond in terms of language, some of that was really about what was going to be effective. And what I'm thinking about what was truly, if we go with sort of the bland language that many of us on the IRB would have been more comfortable with, that in fact you would not have gotten the results that was act would actually be scientifically effective. And that was, again, being provided information about what was expected within the context of our population. Not consent forms, but actually what are the questions that are being asked in the study instrument and various other things that was really, again, having information from about the particular context rather than thinking you could do that more, more generally. I'm um, kind of struggling a little bit still with the medical marijuana example and what the, how that context would actually play out, if that's an example that we want to use for a sensitive topic area for, for research, right? Would the idea be that we would want to recommend not use it, we would not want to use a single IRB so that IRBs in states where it was legal, legalized or decriminalized might say, yes, go ahead with this research, and then other states would say, no, you can't do it here, or is there some idea, which I think might be problematic, um, or is there some idea that um, we would want to shunt the reviews to states that are familiar with this because they've you know, had a referendum or have thought about it more carefully and so have thought through what you know, the law enforcement effects might be if a research participant is like found to have you know, study drug on their person in their car. So I'm, I'm just trying to figure out like that particular example, which direction it goes in, right? Because you might say, that that's a perfect example for single IRB review, right? Instead of to have um, multi-site review because the states that had decriminalized or legalized it would be much more familiar with it and so we would, they have the expertise and we would want to just shuttle it all to them. And that's the opposite of how we're using the example here. So I just want to revisit the framing issue. And, and so the question is really, I don't think we can answer that question here. So I think it's important. but. But the question is, do we consider that something that should be considered by the funding agencies, not knowing what answer we would recommend? I mean, so we have, we have three recommendations, size, participant characteristics, right, local populations, and then study characteristics, the, the sensitivity or the political nature of what you're studying. Those seem like worth stating, but kind of vague. Yeah. vague. Um, is that we're going to have to flesh it out by examples or some other definition of those things that we think are relevant as points to consider. So is there, does anyone feel there's anything, so examples are a good way to flesh it out, and I think even that will be challenging. Can anyone propose things that could be more specific than those very general terms um, that would be worth putting in the high-level recommendations before we get to examples? I, I'm struggling with so it's a challenge to all of you. So there's no urgency on this. I seem to be the person pushing certain issues today. Um, and I'm wondering, I, I think this is a really good conversation. And I think that there's a lot of good food for thought. I think it would be worth taking this back to the subcommittees. And there are some people from the main committee who are on the subcommittees. Because as I hear this, I'm thinking I'd like to sit down with Leslie and Holly and you know, Sandy, and talk about some of the more specific information. Can we cor better corral these issues, provide better examples? I I'm not sure we can do that here right now or, or over this day and a half. And so I was going to suggest we take this back to the subcommittees, we talk about it more, and then we bring it back to the next meeting. Because I think that we basically have agreed on the three main considerations. Um, or three, three main considerations, but what we need is to provide better examples and a little bit better guidance. So that's my suggestion. So does anyone feel there's more work on this that we can do in the 
full committee today or tomorrow. Could I, could I just raise a wild card issue? And you can say <laughs> of no. Of course. Okay. I've already raised two. Go ahead. <laughs> one, of the, one of the things that I've, as an investigator, I've experienced when I've had to take a study through a hundred odd IRBs was that the IRBs involved were institutions that were not technically engaged in the research. And in fact, the institutions opted to review the research more as a control function than as a requirement that they review and as part of an engaged study. And so I, I know this is a wild card and probably not relevant to this, but I just wanted to mention that I, I would love if at, if at some point we suggested that IRBs actually determine whether they're engaged before they undertake a review, because that is an extremely inefficient process. So noted. Um, I'm not sure. I mean, I think it's a great caution. The regulations tell you what you have to do. They don't always tell you what you can do if you want to do it for your own reasons. Yeah, so I, you know, in this case, if you had a study that was going under manda regulatorily mandated single IRB review, could an institution for its own purposes review it separately? I mean, I don't think that's precluded. I don't think its findings would have any standing. Um, doesn't mean they couldn't make things more difficult for the researchers. And I'm not sure how to control for that. But. Uh, you're the chair. But I, I, I mean, I, what worries me about that is then you start putting in the, the basic regulatory criteria, you know, at the outset. I mean, there are a lot of things that need to be considered. Um, I, I think this has a limited focus. But I think what we've been, what we're doing is looking at what are the, I mean, that decision's already been made. So, so given a requirement for single IRB review of multi-site research, what are the types of things do we suggest should be considered as an exception to that? So I think we're, we're a step down in the decision tree. Yeah, I mean, I guess, Sandy, the other, the, where the, I think that's going is basically we would want to discourage extra regulatory review. I think it's hard to just say that without an example. Um, but if you want to provide an example, we can consider putting sort of a general statement that, you know, we recommend people think seriously before extra regulatory review. Having said that, we don't have the status to stop them from doing extra reg regulatory review. So I, I would leave it up to the people from, you know, who, who've experienced this problem whether that would be useful. I'm hungry. Okay. So, <laughs> so I think, you know, we're going to continue. It sounds like we're going to continue this conversation. I have to say it's evolving with the times, which is kind of fun, but, but we're not going to get it done this time. Well, so, so okay, so is this... What so do you want to do? I think let's go back, to, as you suggest, let's go back to the subcommittee, uh, apprise them of the conversation, reframe it around considerations, um, and add examples. Add, add specific examples, Dig challenge them to whether they can come up with anything more specific. I, I'm not sure that they'll be able to, other than examples, which will give us ways to think about this, but I don't even think we could all agree on the outcome of a particular example other than to think about it. So. Two other things that we've already talked about but that I think are important in the document are just things that should not count as relevant context, um, you know, things that we took out, I think, maybe on page two of, of this document. Um, and then the other, is, the other point that it's not all or nothing because I think this does seem to um, leave that out and it's, I think, hugely important, right, that the choice is not one IRB versus every site having their own IRB and if we can make that clear, that will be value added. I think that's important with Got the it. caution that Aviva raised that you don't want to use that as an invitation for people to say not me. 
Um, so I think that danger has to be acknowledged, even though I think it is not all or nothing. Good. So Holly, are you on the subcommittees? I can't remember. Leslie, would you like to be an ad hoc consultant? I would love to be an ad hoc consultant. <laughs> you had some good thoughts. It would be helpful. All right, then. We're back on track, sort of, and it's lunchtime. And given that we've done one of our I was going to call for a shorter lunch to move things along, but given that we've already done one of our post-lunch topics, go wild. <laughs> Take, uh, we'll reconvene it. What do we have? We have an hour, I think. So we'll reconvene at 1.15. All right. So I'm um, happy to be here back with this document today, and we'll, um, we'll start walking through it in a minute just as some background. We've been seeing this for several meetings now, and at the last meeting, we got through all but but one one category um, that was just getting tripped up because some of the language in it, which had been taken from the old list, really just wasn't fitting well under the the, the revised exemptions in the final rule. So um, we took it back to the subcommittee a couple of times. Uh, we got significant input from them, as well as the SACHARP members that contributed to it. Um, Sandra, we were happy to have you on the one call because you had highlighted some of the issues with Category 10 at, at uh, the last SACHART meeting. And um, so what we have in front of this is largely unchanged from the last time we saw it because most of the effort has been going into refining Category 10. Since it was coming back, um, there are a couple other, other minor tweaks that have been made, and I'll point those out. And there were a couple of points that the subcommittees asked SACHARP to reconsider. And so I'll, I'll also talk about those. Otherwise, this really is mostly what you all saw and mostly agreed with last time. I'm happy to, to talk about any of the categories. But just as a reminder, we got through most of them last time with, and, and left them in a pretty good place. So I'm not going to, um, unless there's a desire to, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the front matter. It, it is what it was before, setting out that it's for minimal risk research only. Um, talking about the fact that there is an expectation that whoever is conducting the expedited review do their work to ensure that, that the proposed activities really are minimal risk and fit one of the categories. And um, that front matter really is, is largely uh, unchanged from before, other than some very minor edits. So for example, under applicability A, the categories had to be revised to match the new number of categories as we've shifted things around. But again, otherwise, applicability has, has stayed the same. So when it comes to the categories, um, I'll just talk about the things where there are some very specific changes. A couple of things are tracked in. Um, so first of all, uh, one of the things that, as we'd gone back to the subcommittees, was pointed out, there are some discrepancies at times between what, um, what things were, were non-invasive under Category 3, in which things were non minimally invasive under Category 4. And um, at, at the request of, of a few people, between the last time you saw it and now, I moved, um, moved the removal of permanent teeth down, but I accidentally left them still here. So that I just tracked it out before lunch. Um, that's not supposed to be there. It belongs farther down. Uh, there was some question about whether what is currently H here at line 73 the, the dental plaque and calculus, whether that is um, non-invasive or minimally invasive, I'm happy to have it in either place. I think the other ones are, are pretty straightforward and belong here. Um, but otherwise, that, that section is, is relatively unchanged. And then for, for the minimally invasive, it's not tracked. But here's the, here's the teeth down here. What four brings me to is the first instance where the, the subcommittee has asked, the subcommittees have asked for reconsideration of this exclusion of children from category four um, activities, or at least the four B activities here. There was um, a lot of concern that we were really uh, eliminating what really were minimal risk collection activities. Um, for what we, you know, for purposes that seem somewhat arbitrary from children um, when other categories seem to allow them. You know, I know Jonathan Green's not here. He's a pediatrician. He was in favor of making this change. Uh, input from institutions like um, Children's in Boston 
uh, you know, they, they were making an argument that we were um, really eliminating useful procedures from expedited review that would not have, um, uh, that, that in their reckoning didn't make any sense. And then that is also repeats in Category 5 again. Um, it, at one of, I think, several meetings ago, we added in this limitation that it only be in adults, and the subcommittees thought that um, uh, we were being too restrictive. Um, so those are the, the changes there. And we can come back and talk about all these. There's not that many more changes. Um, this has all stayed the same from before. Sorry for all the scrolling. And then number 10, we can come back and dissect in a few minutes. But this has been radically rewritten, and the examples are gone. That was the consensus of the subcommittees. Um, radical only in the sense that it, it, well, it's radical because it looks nothing like what we had there before, but it really was rewritten to match the current, the, the final rule as written and, and make sure that the, what we're trying to include in here aren't covered by that exemption already. And we actually had trouble coming up with things that would fit in that, but I think we've got, um, we've got a paragraph here that works. Uh, 11 is unchanged, 12 is unchanged, and then 13 and 14 used to be squished together. But because they were trying to carve out things that were not exempted under 104D4 or 104D8, they didn't make sense kind of squished together. So we've just teased them apart. Otherwise, the language is the same. They're meant to address those specific parts of each of those exemptions that wouldn't allow you to exemption, exempt it, uh, but still may be expeditable. Otherwise, from separating them apart, that's, that's the only change there. It made sense to, to pull them apart and um, uh, since they deal with, with distinct exempt categories. So let me jump back up to uh, four and five and, and ask for comments about this idea of, of putting, uh, removing the restriction that it, these, these two categories only apply to adults. In Category 5, the, the extension of general anesthesia is required and must meet the criteria for minimal risk. How are we going to define that, and is that going to be defined differently in adults versus children under picking age two, three, four years? Yeah, that's a good question. And um, if I can scroll down here, we adopted this, um, this description of what would make the extension of anesthesia minimal risk uh, based on, on policies at, at Children's Hospital in Boston where they, they tried to come up with a, a structure for um, determining that. Now, I'm, I'm not a pediatrician or an anesthesiologist, so I cannot, I don't have an opinion on whether or not that really makes it minimal risk, but that is the, the policy they were working off of. So. Um, that would be my answer, is that we've tried to define it here. You know, whether or not, should this list be adopted by SACHARP and then somehow turn into the basis of the starting point for changing the rule, I suspect this is one of those things that would undergo further scrutiny through the, through the process of, of turning this into a final expedited review list. Um, no, I, I think it's going to be very helpful to have guidance on the amount of time, and I would argue that the time could be longer for adults and the time in children maybe should be predicated on an understanding of how long the pr clinical procedure anesthesia time is. Right. Other thoughts on pediatric populations in four and five? All right. Then I'm going to go down to number 10, and, and we can look at that together. Um, so again, in the past, if you remember it, you know, it crammed in lots of different, uh, both, um, both this idea of, of you know, the, we had examples, and it, and it really tried to be very descriptive in the kinds of things it was, it was attempting to allow to be expedited. So here we've kind of stripped it back a little bit to some extent. And so it's research that includes only interaction involving the educational tests, cognitive diagnostic, et cetera. 
Two is survey procedures or interview, intervent, interview procedures or observation of public behavior, not eligible for exemption under 104D2, which I've not memorized yet, and I don't, I don't think I have it on here to pull up, but there we tied it to what couldn't be exempt, either because there are risks to subjects other than informational risks, because that's part of the, the exemption, or because the informational risks are not addressed as specified under um, 104D2 um, Romanets 1 through 3. So, you know, in a, applying that, that part of this expedited category, I mean, there'll either need to be some guidance developed, I think, to go along with it to talk about how you do that, or the person's going to have to um, be, be aware of why it failed the test at 104D2. But that's, you know, that's not, even in our current regulatory framework, that's not unusual. There are things that we know can't be expedited because they're called out, or they can't, you know, they failed an expedited test, and they are then eligible for expedited review. So I think from a process standpoint, these are just citing the new regulations, but in terms of how that process works, IRBs do this all the time with things that didn't pass the test for exemption. And then, um, uh, Number three, other data collection procedures where the subject provides self-reports for the purposes of the research and or may choose what data to provide. Four, non-invasive physical or behavioral tasks or manipulation of the subject's environment. And then five, observations of individual or group behavior where the subject is a voluntary participant in the behavior and is aware of the data being collected. Thoughts, comments, concerns? So subgroup three, other data collection procedures, is just to capture things that might not have been explicitly named in the previous? I mean, may That's correct. Name. So computer-assisted interaction would be 104D3, probably but assessments would fall under this. I just am not sure yeah. what we were thinking about there, except that. So I think in the big picture, our concern was, you know, there, because there was some talk that we said, well, maybe we don't need this category at all because of how, um, you know, the, the exempt categories have been rewritten. But then there's always the concern that if we just sort of threw it out, that invariably somebody would come along and say, well, I've got this thing and it really doesn't fit the exemption but now I also can't expedite it. So some of these, I think, are almost intentionally vague, or you know, we wanted to put a placeholder in there, assuming that something would come along that, in this case, would fit number three. Um, but this was about as specific as we could get with these parenthetical examples. This is also part of the reason we no longer have an attached example list for this particular category, because it, it was really a struggle to come up with things that wouldn't but we couldn't plug into exemptions. And rather than kill ourselves coming up with examples for the sake of having examples, the consensus of the whole group was to just scrap them. So four, non-invasive physical or behavioral tasks or manipulations of the subject's environment, should those be under 11 or 10? So thinking that 10 corresponds to exemption D2 and 11 corresponds to exemption D3, those sound like benign behavioral interventions more than survey procedures. It's a small point. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, I've looked at these so many times I start to forget how we got to the to and this sort of the sense, final language. And I'm trying to remember if there was a rationale why we decided we still needed to have number four in here. And there might have been something maybe about the non-invasive physical manipulation that we thought made it distinct from 11. Behavioral, yeah. But we still say behavioral as well. So I mean, again, as long as it's somewhere, it gets the job done. Well, as long as it's somewhere, it gets the job done. And, you know, at the end of the day, I suppose if somebody had a research protocol and they said, well, geez, you know, I don't know, really know if it's 10 or 11. As long as it's one of those, I don't think you're going to get in too much trouble if you picked one over the other.
Yeah, and I'm, yeah. Yeah. No, I agree. I mean, I take it's this is really hard to cleanly parse these apart and not leave holes. Right. I think that's the what the subcommittees have been challenged by. And of course, this is different than our typical recommendations in that this is the expedited review list as David has said repeatedly, this is not going to be the final expedited review list. This will go through much more review and what we produce will influence that but is not the final document. So I don't think it has to be perfect. <laughs> Bless you. Um, other thoughts or concerns looking at this? Would people be comfortable using this if it, say, was the final document? So I think we're at a place we could stop. Well, I, I thought Mark got off easy. This is. <laughs> Something, I, <coughs> I'm waiting for the other shoe to fall here. No, I mean, I, I, we spent a lot of time on this, so I'm, I'm you know, the, the fact that we're not getting a lot of comments doesn't bother me. We've had plenty of comments on this over the last several meetings. So it's, uh, you know, I think the subcommittees are happy that we've gotten to a place where it makes sense in the, in the, the framework of the new rule that we haven't left any, any gaps that we would regret should it be, you know, if it were somehow to become this category in particular, become the rule that we've, uh, left a gap that isn't addressed otherwise, um, and so I'm I'm certainly happy that that people seem to be satisfied with it. I'll make one other observation, <clears throat> which is I think that we're still struggling with the change from an explicit minimal risk determination to a presumption and then detection if it's not, and the consequences of that. I still, to to me, really. I'm comfortable with all this, assuming someone is actually making that assessment, whether they have to document it or not. So I mean, no, we have that in bold. There's nothing else we can do about that. We're very explicit about it. But I think it is, you know, the alternative to my mind is to, if we really wanted to make these cleanly all minimal risk, it would reduce them so much that there'd be a lot less research that could be expedited. So I think that's just, uh, it'll be interesting to see what the final list looks like. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I think we've, We've done the work that we can in the front end of this document to call that out repeatedly. Um, I, I think you know once it gets to the point of way down the road when there when there is some implementation, then it becomes a matter that there may be need additional guidance on, you know, applying expedited review categories in the new sort of the new general framework, um, and maybe we'll get called back to help work on that at some point. But Jerry, any thoughts? Is this useful to you? Oh, no, absolutely. Uh, as you noted, I mean, again, this is going to be a complicated document in terms of how it will ultimately go out to the public in terms of asking them to comment on something. I don't think we know that, and clearly there will be other agency players in terms of this. So, uh, but no, very helpful. Thank you. Any last comments before I call for a b vote on endorsing this as a SACAR recommendation? Just a draft inquiry. For item 10, uh, sub item 5, is intended to be individual and group, or, or is uh, supposed to be inclusive of both categories? I probably supposed to be in a war. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Then I would invite a motion to approve this as a SACARP recommendation. Second, moved and seconded to approve this document with the changes you've made now uh, as a finalized recommendation. Discussion? All in favor of approval say aye. aye. Motion passes. All right, I have clicked save, so with the new file name. I should have asked. Saved. Anyone abstaining or objecting? No, okay, good. Thank you. <laughs> all right, well, that's all I got, Steve. Public comments? I know it's a little bit. So public comment was scheduled at 4.15. So um, it's a little bit unfair to the public if they um, had planned to be here at 4.15. On the other hand, 
Now's the time. So, um, and there's always tomorrow if we miss it today. So is there, are, is there anyone from the public who wishes to make comment on today's proceedings or other issues? All right, thank you. Um, I guess then I would entertain a motion to adjourn. I haven't either. No one's comfortable making the motion. <laughs> so I'm not e <laughs> All right. Well, I will then, if there are no objections, I'll declare us adjourned.